what we'll be doing today is we will build um, one function to create the four basic SPC charts uh, that is uh, mentioned in the article uh, from Mohammed. Um, when the day is over, uh, as I said before, uh, this is the first time I, I try this workshop. So I have no idea of uh, how fast we'll be moving. Um, we may finish this function uh, at noon, or we may strive uh, to finish it uh, by the end of the day. I don't know, but I have uh, I have lots of things that we could uh, that we could add to the workshop if we get bored about this. But but the idea is to create this one function that illustrates the principles of how to create workshops with R. Don't expect this function to uh, to uh, solve all your SPC problems in the future. For that, I recommend that you either build on this function uh, that we will create today or that you use uh, an R package. There are several R packages uh, for creating SPC charts. Uh, my package is, uh, uh, I have created two packages. Uh, the current one is called QI charts 2, uh, which does um, everything that we are going to build today plus a lot more. And uh, I hope that we will have time to introduce this package uh, uh, later this uh, afternoon. But uh, by building one function, I hope to um, introduce you to the principles behind how to make R uh, you do um, SPC charts. Um, uh, and and, and uh, we'll do this by, uh, I'll be coding. We'll make this function from scratch and I'll do some coding and you follow on the screen and then you replicate my code. It, it might seem silly, but actually it's a, it's a good way to learn R to see how I do things and then switch to your own uh, screen and, uh, and start uh, uh, achieving the same results that I achieved on, on my screen. And then I will, um, uh, I'll try and uh, make lots and lots of small breaks. I prefer small breaks, small five minute breaks. Uh, oh, there's Zoe. Hi, Zoe. Uh, I prefer lots of small breaks and we'll have a lunch break uh, in the middle of the day. I don't know when you're used to lunch. Um, I, 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 it appears to me that, um, that um, you, have, uh, you start working a little later than we do in Denmark uh, around nine o'clock. In Denmark, we used to start around seven or eight and that you have lunch maybe around one o'clock. Um, uh, but tell me if you get hungry and need a, um, uh, a break and uh, but otherwise, I expect that we'll break for lunch around uh, uh, half past 12 uh, uh, to, to one o'clock and then have uh, half an hour for lunch, if that's okay with you. If anyone needs a longer um, break, uh, just, uh, just say so. Okay, Jen is with me. Hi, Zoe, we missed you. Could you introduce yourself? I have, I have, I have told the participants that you are here to, uh, to uh, what do you say? Do you use the expression "sweep up" after me? All, no. all my mistakes, and, and uh, you have to uh, to uh, explain that to the participants. Well, I've, uh, some people may know me here as well, so you'll be sweeping up after me. Um, facilitate, I think, is the thing. So, anybody has any questions as um, Jacob's going through the course, uh, the workshop? I'll be here to help technically. And if anybody has any issues, I can go out into a breakout room if that makes it easier to go through things. And I'm so sorry to be late. It was my timekeeping skills. I got the wrong diary entry. <laughs> it's my own doing. So you have to sweep up after me, I'm afraid, Jacob. But I'm okay. so pleased to be here. So thank you for introducing me when I should have been introducing you. It's all the wrong way around. That's that. That's great. Okay. Oh, I didn't introduce um, myself, did I? I'm Zoe Turner. I'm a data scientist with no timekeeping skills um, from Nottingham Healthcare Trust. And I'm very honored to be here to help um, uh, with this particular workshop. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for, for joining and thank you for uh, uh, being the chair of this, uh, this session. One more thing, I, I have to uh, apologize for the, the, the poor picture quality. My PC, my laptop is equipped with what's called a belly cam. It's positioned in the lower left corner of my screen. Um, if, you, if, you, um, if you happen to see by my belly, you will be able to count the hairs in my nose. Um, but I I, uh, I, uh, I plan to share my screen at least to make my picture a little bit smaller. 
So I'm sharing a screen now. Uh, does anyone not see my screen? Then speak up. That's great. And Zoe, one of the things I want from you is to keep an eye out for, for hands and chat messages uh, because I probably won't notice them. Um, uh, and then, uh, as I told the participants, speak up whenever you have something to say. Whenever I say uh, something that's hard to understand or um, uh, even wrong, uh, speak up uh, to help me uh, get things right from, from the beginning. So this is the, um, uh, uh, the uh, four files I ask you to download. The most important one is this uh, R4SPC. And it actually includes a solution. If I click on it, this is what we're going to do today. We're going to build this function. And if you already have done this, uh, well, then there's no reason for you to, to be here. If you want to, to get an explanation of what's actually happening in all this, uh, these lines, they, they, then uh, hang on. But this is what we are going to do. And we are going to do it in a way that we, that we start by downloading this file. Uh, by the way, is any, are any of you on, uh, on the RStudio cloud? Um, uh, then Zoe is here to help you. I have no experience using the cloud. I, uh, I, uh, I suggest that you use a local copy of R and, and then download this file. But, but uh, we have set up an environment for the RStudio cloud. And uh, if it doesn't work for you, uh, then, then please ask now, and so we will uh, uh, we, we'll be able to uh, to help you. Um, anyone having problem uh, troubles with the uh, Studio Cloud? It seems okay at the moment, but I'm here for any help if needed. Great. So I will I will assume that all of you have downloaded these four files to a local folder on your computer. Um, to get rid of these. Yeah. What's happening? Sec. That's it. I, I've made a folder um, with these four files, and um, uh, there are two data files this one and this one um, uh, that we'll be using later. Uh, but this is uh, what we are going to do now. I will open this file with our studio. Um, and uh, 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 please note also that today we will be using purely base R until we get to the QI charts uh, R package. But, but this function uses, uses only base R functionality. Uh, and that's uh, an attempt to avoid problems with installing packages uh, and all that. So we'll be using base R, and uh, I know that that would be a new experience for many because everybody, including me, um, are using the, um, the, uh, the tidyverse function. I'm a big fan of the tidyverse, but once in a while, it's useful to be able to use um, a base R function. And also it's very, um, it's very uh, pedagogical to, um, to build plots using base R functions. So I will ask you, to open this file on your computer, R for SPC underscore solution, and then make a copy of this file where you simply take away the solution. And when you have done that, delete everything below the comments. So now we have a clean uh, environment for start working with, uh, with this. Um, and then the idea is that here is the assignment. We will work through uh, this, this assignment line by line, uh, building SPC plots. And, um, and along the way, I hope that we will, um, uh, that you will ask all the questions you need to ask about SPC. Why are we doing this or that? that and how does this function work? Or um, some things, uh, a lot of things might seem uh, self-explanatory to me because I have used them for years, but might be new to some of you and vice versa. So, so again, please speak up. So um, I suggest we take a short break now, uh, five minutes. Um, you can see my watch down here. I am one hour ahead of you. So I will be back uh, at uh, 11.05 Danish time. That would be 9.05 your time, isn't that right? So I'll be back in five minutes uh, and please prepare. 
So take this script, make a copy of it and delete everything below the comments. Okay, and then uh, if you have questions, we'll start with that if, uh, after the, the break, okay? Hello, I'm back. So uh, did you all manage to um, uh, get the file and make a copy of that file with uh, the solution uh, deleted? Please raise your hand if you're ready to uh, continue. Okay. Looks good. Uh, does anybody have uh, problems we need to solve before moving on? Then speak up. Um, there is one person who's got a problem with the cloud and I'm just gonna check their settings. I think um, I might need to go into another room with them. Okay, so you will fix that while I continue. That's great, thank you. I'll start sharing my screen again. Um, Very confusing with all these little windows. Okay, so uh, the first assignment is about uh, making a very basic standardized control chart. Uh, a control chart is, I hope you know that already, is a plot of data over time. Um, so uh, we will create some data to play with. And for teaching purposes, it's very useful to use random numbers. Um, uh, the, the theory of control charts is built about uh, the concept of randomness and the control chart is actually a test uh, of randomness in a sequence of data. So uh, to create random numbers, we will use the R norm function Ah, so, uh, by, the, by the way, uh, when I'm programming and you can see my screen, please uh, watch me and then you will have to do to repeat uh, the programming uh, on your own uh, in a while. We'll take it in very small steps. So um, this is the R norm. R stands for random and norm stands for normal. So this is, these are, it creates random numbers from a normal distribution. By default, the mean of this di distribution is zero. So here we have 24 random numbers from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. You can go to the help page to read more. By the way, can you see my screen? Do I need to, um, to uh, zoom in a bit? Um, please let me know if I need to zoom in. Nobody's complaining. Uh, no, I can see you fine. You can see fine. Yeah, it looks good to me. Yeah, fine. Because uh, I uh, I can zoom in, but then uh, oh, somebody has said yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Yes, please. I'll try and, and and zoom. Is this better? Oh, it is. Uh, it is for me. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Let me try and make this a, a, com a compromise. So this is how to create random numbers. These are twenty-four random numbers, and during the day we'll be working with random numbers. And you have to imagine that these numbers uh, represent some measure of quality in healthcare. It could be waiting times or patient complaints or falls or medication errors or whatever you're working with. These numbers represent some random process. Um, and by random, we mean that uh, the numbers are unrelated. You cannot from one number predict what the next number will be but they come out of the same process, meaning that you know 
on average and within limits where you should expect future numbers to, to be. Like tossing a, um, a uh, throwing a die, uh, you don't know what the next number will be, but you, you know that it will be somewhere between one and six. And you know that by on average, you should expect uh, the number to be three and a half. So that's the nature of randomness. You cannot know the exact output, the next output, but you know uh, uh, the, the uh, um, area of opportunity and the, the probabilities connected to that. So these are 24 random numbers and we will, we will assign these numbers to a variable that, uh, uh, that we will call Y. So now I'm assigning 24 random numbers to a variable called Y. Whenever I run this code, I get 24 new random numbers. Um, and these numbers we want to plot. So for that, we will use the base R plot function. If I plot Y, by default, R plots each number in, uh, in the order they were created. Um, and this is our starting chart. I want to make some changes to the chart. First, I want to use another plotting symbol by uh, specifying this argument of the plot function, the PCH plotting character. Does it mean I don't want number 19, which is a closed circle? And then I want, uh, want the, the plot to be of type. O for overplotted, that means connect the dots with lines. This is our first run chart, you can call it. This is a very primitive run chart of 24 random numbers. And whenever we run all this code, by the way, I use shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts all the time. And by rerunning uh, the code, I simply press Control, Shift, Enter. Uh, I don't know if that works in our studio cloud. Otherwise, you could click the source button up here. And whenever we do that, we get new random numbers. Um, so that's our basic uh, run chart. And in a control chart, we need to add three lines, uh, one line for the lower control limit and one for the upper control limit, and then the center line. And for this standardized control chart, because we know the parameters of the normal distribution that the mean is zero, we will place the center line at zero. And because we know that the standard deviation is one, we will place the control limits at negative three and three. Um, so to, um, to add a line to a plot, we can do that in several ways, but I will use the lines function. Um, I want to add a line with a value of zero. This doesn't work because there's only one zero. I, I need to repeat, uh, I need to create a vector with as many zeros as there are numbers in the Y variable. So uh, repeat zero. Uh, now, so this is first we build the plot um, layer by layer. First we plot data, then we add the center line. I suggest uh, you do this now in your, uh, in your program. Um, and then uh, whenever you have finished, uh, raise your hand. Um, if I can still see your hands, I hope I can. Um, uh, and then we'll move on when everybody is, uh, is ready to, uh, to continue. And please again, ask if there's anything not working for you. Okay, this is your task. And you are, you are allowed to, to cheat by looking at my code, but try to do it uh, by not looking at the at first.
you may write your questions in the chat. I see six hands. If uh, any uh, of you have uh, problems, please uh, write it in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'll give you a few more minutes and you will be able to pick up later. Okay, one more minute. Okay, a few of you haven't raised your hands. I hope that's not because you're in serious trouble um, because now we'll move on. And um, if you're having troubles, uh, uh, I or Zoe might be able to help you in, in the next break. Okay, so let's continue. Um, uh, I, I think you might have uh, figured out how to uh, how to make lines for the negative three and the three control limits. But we, before we do that, I want to take this uh, and make it a parameter um, uh, and say this is the center line. And then I will I'll do this. Can you see that? Because then we can we can reuse this uh, this uh, variable again and again, and we will re reuse it for creating the uh, control limits. The lower control limit is actually the center line minus three, and the upper control limit is the center line plus three. Um, so now it's pretty easy to add the lower and the up control limits and run everything. Now tell me, why don't these control limits show up in my plot? I can re rerun it many times. Um, the lower and upper control limits are not showing up in my plot. Um, why is that? Anyone has a guess? Just speak up. No, oh, there, there you can see the lower control limit. In this plot, it's there. But in other plots, it's not there. The thing is that the plot function only knows what it knows at the time of plotting. 
and it scales the um, uh, the the axis. It scales the axis uh, to to fit uh, the y values. So we need to add a parameter or an argument, y lim, how to scale the y axis to the range of y values and lower control limit and upper control limit. Now we have the control limits. Can you see that? Please do that. Make the center line a, uh, an object uh, or a variable you can reuse for creating lower and upper control limits and then add the three lines to your plot and raise your hand when you're done. And as always, if you have any questions to what's happening in this program or why we are doing what we're doing, write, write your questions in the chat. You may want to keep your hand raised until everybody is, uh, is finished. Thank you, Zoe. Good question from Vicky. We'll take that. Okay, I think we'll we are we are there now, ready to move on. Vicky asked, "What happens if we get a plot outside uh, the limits? Um, will the uh, the plot contain that?" Well, let's try. That's a very good question. I just have to minimize this. Uh, we can try. We can. We can actually. We can. We can move our random numbers by uh, by specifying the mean of this process um, to say, say two. If we do that, the numbers will move up, and uh, any data point outside the control limits will be still be in the plot because we used the YLIM argument and included the range of both the Y values and the control limits. So whatever you do here, you would have a mean of 99. We will still have all the points and the control limits. But um, for now, we will keep the, uh, the, the mean value at zero. Um, remember the R norm function, which is here, has by default, a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And we will play around with what happens when we, when we actually change the mean. That, that would mimic a situation where our quality measures or our indicators are actually moving. We are, by, by doing this, we introduce a shift in data. Uh, but we, for now, we'll keep it on zero. OK, um, is everybody happy to move on? I am, so I'll move on. The next assignment is actually about making points outside control limits stand out because that's what signals a, a non-random variation or a special cause as uh, Schuhart uh, called it, a special cause that would be one or more data points outside control limits. Um, so if we introduce a, um, 
a shift in data, we will expect to see data points outside the control limits. And uh, to make the analysis of the chart easier to our eyes, uh, I want to make them a different color. So it's easier to spot by, by simply looking at the chart. Um, and to do that, uh, we will create a new vector. Uh, we will simply ask what Y values are less than the lower control limit or greater than the upper control limit. If we do that, um, we can see that some data points, when this is true, that's this data point because it's greater than the upper control limit. And we will assign this to a, um, uh, an object, we could call it signal, uh, sigma signals. So now we have a, a, an object called sigma signals, which is a logical vector. Uh, and we can use that vector in a handy way. If we now add points to our graph, um, we, we, we simply replot all the y values with the same uh, symbol, and then we color it according to the sigma, sigma limits. Um, and then I add one. Why do I add one? That's to convert the sigma, the logical vector. Sorry, I need to do this. I convert the sigma limits. What's wrong here? Sigma limits signals. Sorry. Now it's converted to the numbers one and two, and the color one is black, and the color two is. Wait and see, it's red. So this is a, a handy way of adding information to the chart by simply plotting a new layer. We are replotting the Y values with the same uh, character and a color that depends on, on, uh, on whether it's outside the control limits or not. You could of course uh, choose to use other colors uh, uh, and rather than, than using this um, expression, you could use an if else statement if you want the the uh, the signal color to be green or blue or whatever. But but this is an easy way to do it uh, with the uh, with base R. So please do that. Uh, play around. Uh, change the the mean of your process to say two, and then uh, create this vector of uh, of uh, logical vector of whether a data point is outside a control limit and then add points that are colored accordingly. Okay, and raise your hand and, and, and leave your hand raised until um, everybody's finished. And still, if you have any questions, uh, uh, write them in the chat or speak up.
I see five hands and I see no complaints in the chat. Can we move on? If nobody protests, we will move on. Uh, and we will, yeah, eight hands, great. Then we'll move on. Now back to this, make points outside control limits stand up, stand out, sorry. Uh, and then uh, the next task is to rerun the code many times. Let's reset the center. So now we have a purely random process with a center of zero. Um, and now you should rerun this code um, many times uh, until you get a signal. This is a test of how often random um, uh, numbers uh, by accident uh, lands outside of the control limits. It will happen once in a while. That, that's one. This is purely random, but it, it would signal a special course in a, in a control child. This is actually a false positive. And that, would, that happens once in a while. And I want you to test how often does this actually happen that we have a false signal. And, um, and rerun the code and then count how many times do you have, do you rerun the code? And you rerun the code by simply sourcing everything. And then you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Mm -hmm. Uh, 20, I, I got 20 runs until I got a signal out. I want every, everybody to do that and then write your number in the chat and you're allowed to, uh, to, to do it as many times as you, as you are able to while we're waiting for everybody. Matthew 39, Nikki 11. <laughs> Bruce is fast. Jenny only three. That's interesting, isn't it? So can you see a pattern uh, uh, forming here that uh, everybody gets a false signal once in a while? And there seems to be a law around this. There seems to be a distribution of how many times do you rerun this code until you get a false signal. And this is one of the most important lessons in, uh, in statistical process control, or rather in any kind of statistics, that you will always have false positives tests. Um, and you don't know when you have it that it is a false positive. You only get a signal and you will have to investigate what's going on here. But bear in mind that once in a while you will have false signals. Uh, the opposite uh, is also true that uh, once in a while, even if we have a shift in our data, the process control chart will not detect it. So we have false positives and false negatives. And it's important to realize, especially for analysts like you, that the control chart is not the truth. There's, there, there, there are in, in statistics, there are that there is no such thing as a proof of anything. Uh, the, the only thing that statistics adds, that is uh, some sense of, uh, of security. How, how certain are we uh, of, uh, we, we, uh, statistics help us to uh, put numbers up on our uncertainty. So this is an important lesson. Once in a while, you will have false positive signals. Now, um, I want you to think about, and uh, we could do that during a break, I want you to think about what would affect the chance of a false signal um, apart from, uh, from a shift in data. What other parameters could we change in, in our code that would affect the chance of a, uh, of a false positive?
positive or, or a positive signal. Um, for instance, uh, it's obvious that if I introduce a shift in data, I won't have to wait as long. I will have to wait, but not as long. But what other parameters uh, could I um, uh, adjust to increase the risk of a false signal? Uh, let's take five minutes break. Uh, as you see, I've adjusted my, my watch to, uh, to your time. So now it is uh, 10.35 and we'll meet again at 10.40. And then uh, I want you to think about what would affect the chances of false signal in, in a run chart of this. Okay, I'll stop sharing and mute and then we'll see each other in five minutes. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, we've got one comment from Matthew. If we plot more data points, we will have more chance of getting a signal. But I don't think that increases the chance of any one signal being a false positive. Now that's interesting, Matthew. Would, would you like to expand on that? Why wouldn't uh, a signal from a random process with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, why would that not be a false signal? Maybe Matthew is not back. What Matthew is uh, suggesting is that the, if, I, if I plot, say, uh, a thousand data points, I will get, say, no, actually, I didn't get any signal this time. But, but the chance of one or more signals increases greatly when the number of data points increase. Can you see that? Uh, but why are you there, Matthew? Matthew, uh, why, yeah. Yeah, why would that not be a false signal? Uh, well, no, it, it would still be the false positive, but it mm. wouldn't be at any. It wouldn't be an increased rate, like per per point, because each point is independent. I get your point. That that's that's uh, that's very true. Uh, that it, it it would be a a signal. Uh, it would be expected when we have a thousand random numbers. We know that once in a while, uh, as we increase the sample size, we will have more and more numbers in the in the tails of the normal distribution. Uh, so, so you're absolutely right. Um, Jr. Uh, asked, "What if data uh, process is not normal?" Well, we could try that. Uh, what would uh, we could we could use another function for generating random numbers? There are random number generators in R for binomial or, or Poisson distribution for uh, exponential and negative exponentials, and a lot of other distributions in R. And I encourage you to uh, play around with those. Then you might not uh, want to set the control limits at minus three and plus three, depending on what type of distribution you are playing around with. Um, when we later today get to different types of control charts, uh, we will discuss different distribution for, for that. But uh, but that is um, that's a very important point, Jr. Um, Walter Schuhart, who invented the control chart, he um, he experimented a lot um, with practical experiments to find out where should we put the control limits. Uh, many people, especially in healthcare. Uh, have this notion of plus minus two standard deviations of being a reasonable limits for what is normal and not normal or natural and not natural. That would not work in a control chart because 5% of all our data points would be outside at two standard deviation limits. And Schuhart figured out uh, by, again, by practical experiments, uh, by uh, empirical, empirical uh, experiments that that uh, putting control limits at uh, negative three and three um, gives the best trade-off between false positives and false negatives. And this is highly independent of the distribution. Even if you have a very skewed distribution, like the exponential distribution, uh, more than 98% of your data points are expected to be within negative three and three 
Um, and that's, that's one of the main features of the control chart that it is very robust for deviations. Uh, it, it actually does not assume your data to be normally distribute, distributed. Is that the right way to say that? Um, uh, but for, for the purpose of teaching, the normal distribution is, is uh, very easy to play around with. And that's why we use that. But please feel free to experiment with, uh, with all the distributions. Um, maybe not right now, but uh, you can do that tonight or tomorrow or whenever you like. Um, but the control chart is very robust for data not being normally distributed. And the, the, uh, the plus and minus um, three standard deviations is a very uh, reasonable trade-off between false positives and false negatives, regardless of the distribution. Okay, uh, any more questions or comments? Uh, also, please, if are we going too fast or too slow, then um, please write it in the, in the chat and I'll try and adapt. I might not be able to make everybody happy, but I can try. So um, feel free to speak up. Otherwise, I will move on now. So one thing that affects the chance of a signal, or in this case, a false signal, that is the number of data points. And that is also why control charts, um, uh, it is recommended that you keep your number of data points in a control chart uh, between 20 or 30. If you have fewer than 20 data points, you might overlook um, uh, important signals. And if you have mu much more than 30 data points, you will give more false positives. Of course, you can do uh, control charts with 1,000 data points like in this one. You should just be aware that, uh, that you, you are expected to have signals. There are some authors of SPC books that actually recommend adjusting the negative three and the three uh, according to the number of data points. Uh, I have never used this, but, uh, but, but, but some actually do. Uh, but as long as you keep your control charts with uh, between 20 and 30 data points, um, and of course you are allowed to go below uh, a bit uh, above that, um, then you, should, uh, you will have the best balance between false positives and, uh, uh, and false negatives. Now, Next job is, let's get back to 24 data points. Next up is how big a shift, and uh, remember we can introduce a, an artificial shift in data by uh, increasing the, uh, the theoretical mean of, the, um, of our samples. How big a shift in data would it take to have almost every control chart signal? Now I introduce a shift and here actually there's no signal in this, in this control chart. We could also use a 0.5 shift in data. Um, so I want you to experiment with different settings for this, uh, this mean. Um, remember, this is the mean parameter. Uh, how much would you increase, how, how big a shift would you introduce to have almost every control chart signal and that would be a true positive signal uh, and when you when you have done that a few times write it in the chat what your results are please go ahead could you just um <clears throat> excuse me move the the lines down so that we could see just uh the the color on the points is just off the screen uh, line 26, for example, I think it is, and maybe 27, so that you can see the full chunk. Is that all right? That's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's the zoom. Yeah.
No more suggestions? Okay, around four or five uh, has been suggested. Uh, let's try, uh, I'll try and do it. Now I have a shift of one. That's a signal. So one is clearly not enough. So, so this, is, this is a situation where we know there is a shift in data. The quality of whatever we are measuring has changed, and, uh, but the control chart does not detect it every time maybe every other time or something like that, if we introduce a shift of one. I'll try and increase that to two. There's a signal, there's a signal. If I increase to two, I, 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 it's my experience that almost every control chart will signal. We can try five and indeed, okay, I see what you mean now. Here we have all the points outside five. What, I'm, what I meant was uh, to have the chart have at least one data point outside the control limits. Um, so you're right. If we want every, all data points to be outside the control limits, we should go around four or five to have that. If we want just one or more data points to be outside the control limits, uh, two is usually enough. And we could play around with one point, sorry, 1.5. We're getting there. So somewhere between 1.5 and 2, if we have a shift in our process um, of um, close to two standard deviations, the control chart will pick it up every time. And that's a feature of the control chart. And it has been very well described in the literature that control charts are most sensitive to moderate to large shift in data of uh, at least uh, one and a half to two standard deviations. And that's also important for you as analysts to know that whatever you apply a control chart to data, its diagnostic value, its sensitivity uh, uh, depends on the, on the size of the shift you are trying to detect. Um, so if you are looking for a change in waiting times, uh, using a control chart, you would, you would want to design your sampling process so that the shift you're looking for uh, will, so that the control chart will be able to pick up a shift of around two standard deviations. And two standard deviations may be, uh, in many situations, that's, that's quite a large shift in data. It, when we work with the quality improvement in healthcare, we uh, often expect shifts in the order of one standard deviation and, uh, and, and thereabout. So um, we need some measures of increasing uh, the, um, the sensitivity of the control chart to minor and moderate shift. So if we look at this shift of one, not every control chart will pick up that up, at least not with the, with the single test of one or more data points outside the control limit. Look at this, it's obvious to the eye that something has shifted here. The mean of this process is not zero. We can see that by, uh, by the naked eye, um, but the control chart does not uh, detect it. So what can we do to increase the sensitivity of a control chart to minor and moderate shifts in data. Um, I would like some suggestions from you in the chat, or maybe you could just speak up. How, how can we increase the sensitivity to minor to moderate shifts in, in control charts? And uh, I think it would be nice at this point to have a, a discussion. So I'll stop sharing and I'll uh, encourage you to simply speak up, what can we do to increase the sensitivity? Um, Jakob, is that introducing other rules as well? Like if it was certain- um, oh, Sorry, um, I, didn't, I didn't hear you, your microphone. Uh, I, oh, sorry, a... um, is it introducing other rules? So you're not just, you know- yeah, that, so... that, 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 That's actually what I'm asking for. Could we invent other rules? Actually, right now we are working with one rule, that is one or more data points 
that show up outside the control limits. But uh, we, are, we, are, we are trying to invent other rules that would detect minor shifts in data or moderate shifts in data. Uh, Matthew, would you uh, expand on, on your question? Could we detect a change in the mean within a set value? Um, what I was just thinking if we, because if we plotted the mean as a line, as a line, it would definitely be, you know, it, it will definitely have moved from that zero center line. Um, but I'm not sure how we would do that without also triggering the, um, the false positives because th that mean is also going to change in an, in sort of a, a way just like the um, the upper and lower confidence limits. So, so um, uh, if I understand you correctly, you're you're commenting about <clears throat> uh, the fact that we are using a fixed center line and control limits right now, and when we move on to having the the lines um, uh, be based on on the actual mean of the data we are putting into the control chart, then the, then the center line of control limits will move along with the, the with the change in mean. Is that what you are asking? Uh, yeah. So not so much changing the center line, but comparing the center line to the actually observed mean, because we we know that it should be around zero. So I guess that's not the same thing because we're we're working on the assumption that it's got a zero center line already yeah you, you you could say that actually um some people say that a control chart is a, a one kind of a hypothesis testing that we're actually testing whether the data the, the 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 actual data have a center that matches the center of the control chart uh imagine you have a process waiting times or computation rates and you know for historical reasons you know from historical data that the waiting times uh, average to one hour. And then you put some new data in that control chart and the mean of the new data differs significantly from the historical mean. That's actually what the control chart does. It tests your assumption that the mean of these data uh, um, is somewhere close to the, to the fixed mean that we are using. That's one way of looking at control charts. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so Lindsay, you suggested inventing other rules for detecting minor shifts in data. In, uh, anyone has uh, suggestions for, for other rules, or do you have those yourself, Lindsay? Um, yeah, I suppose the ones that um, I'd be familiar with is if there's a certain number of points above the mean. Um, so, from memory, I remember eight, maybe, or something, you know, so yeah, a certain number above the mean. Um, and then I suppose you can also have warning limits, so two standard deviations that if there's maybe two above that or something, consecutive points um, is another rule. Um, but yeah, there's yeah there's something about runs. I can't remember. Yeah. These. I know they were in the papers that you shared, um, yeah. but I just can't re I remember without looking. Yeah, you're, you're, you're perfectly right. Um, uh, a, a number of uh, supplementary rules for detecting minor to moderate shifts in control charts uh, are available and have been available for, for many, many years. The control chart was invented in 1924 by Walter Schuhart. And uh, during the 1950s, uh, a lot of rules were published, especially in the uh, Western Electric Quality Control Handbook, I think it's called that. Um, a very interesting um, uh, book, you can find it uh, in a PDF version on, uh, on, uh, online. I think I have referenced it referenced it in the, in the course materials. And there you'll see a lot of supplementary rules for different purposes. And you mentioned one rule is a, an unusually long run of data points on one side of the center line. So if you have many, many data points on the same side of the center line, that would be a signal that this process is shifting. Uh, imagine uh, uh, imagine sh uh, throwing a coin uh, if you throw a coin 10 times and you get a hits every time, you would, you would wonder what's wrong with this coin. That would be unusual. And uh, you could say the same with, with uh, throwing a dice. If you get uh, high values, if you get um, six uh, sixes in one throw, that would be unusual. 
It would not be impossible, but it would be unusual. And that's a theory of control chart that we are looking for something that is unusual in random processes. And again, we are not proving that this process is not random. We are simply suggesting uh, that the operator of this process should start looking for reasons why this unusual pattern turns up. Um, and the, as I said, there are many, many rules out there to detect minor shifts. Um, uh, one is the long runs rules, and there are also rules based on the, the one and two standard deviation lines. If you have a certain number of data points further out than two standard deviations, uh, that would be a signal. And if you have uh, another uh, run of many numbers outside the one standard deviation, that would be a, another signal. Actually, these rules are called the Western Electric rules that were proposed by the Western Electric Company, where Schuhart did his work. Uh, and those rules have been the mainstay of uh, statistical process control for uh, more than half a century. Uh, and they are very effective uh, and very good uh, I don't use those rules myself in my QI charts to package. Uh, that's not because they are not good, uh, but that's because uh, I have stumbled across a couple of other rules that are actually easier to work with and, uh, and are, uh, can, can be used uh, as standalone rules for run charts that do not have control limits. And so, so it's easy with, with, uh, with, with the rules I will suggest to you in a while to, to uh, switch between run charts without control limits and control charts that have control limits. And you just have to use the same set of rules for analyzing them. But otherwise, the Western Electric rules, um, the, one, the, the rule number one is one or more data points outside the three sigma limit, the three standard deviation limit, either above or below. Rule number two is two out of three consecutive data points further out than two standard deviations. Rule number three is four out of five consecutive data points further uh, away from the center line than one standard deviation. And rule number four is eight or more data points in a row uh, on the same side of the center line. Those are the Western electric rules. And those are the standard in many, uh, many software installations of statistical process control. Um, I will, I will teach you a couple of other rules, uh, mostly for the fun of it, but feel free to apply any rule you want. But just be aware that adding rules to your control chart also adds uh, the risk of false positive signals. Uh, we'll be doing that. So uh, should we take a short break now? Uh, there is, a, a, hand there is a hand up. Sorry, yeah, there's there a hand are. up. Yeah. Uh, could, we, could we compare... Um, a value with the previous value, and if it's different by a certain amount, then you could call that significant, couldn't it? I mean, would that be a rule? So, for example, if if the first value was zero and the second value was three, uh, yeah. then that's a clearly a big change in the values. Uh, and so, I suppose so. you can expand it further and actually have a moving average, and if it changes by a certain. That's actually a very good suggestion, and and that's the basis of what's called the moving range chart, where we are looking for. Uh, the pairwise differences, the absolute difference between neighboring data points. And if that difference is unusually large, we take it that there's a shift in data at this point. That's also one of the tests. And in the Western Electric Handbook, there are many, many more uh, tests for unnatural patterns in data. Um, most of these other tests are, are, are for special purposes in production industry. You may also have tests for for oscillations, if, they, if data points uh, go like this all the way, uh, one data point being above the center line and next being below and so on, that would be a, a signal of some other type of unnatural um, influence on your process. We don't see that in healthcare improvement because improvement is always about shifts in data, not about uh, 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 what's it called, uh, sawtooth patterns. And again, there are many other types of, um, of, of uh, unnatural patterns in data. But JR, you're right. And actually, that uh, suggestion is the basis of the, uh, the eye chart and the moving range charts. Uh, all the, together, they're called the XMR chart that has been described in Mohammed's paper that we'll get to in a while. Dom, you have a hand? 
But yeah, I was going to say the other kind of thing we haven't discussed rather than adding rules is transforming the data to make the type of differences we're looking for more obvious. Um, I don't know whether there's forms of normalization or I guess similar to what um, GR was mentioning with the, the difference of differences. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's a good suggestion. Uh, actually, what we're doing right now with this standardized control chart is a kind of, of uh, transforming. We are working with random normal data with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. You could make any data set behave like that if you, if you normalize the data uh, by subtracting uh, the mean from all the data and dividing by the standard deviation. So that's one type of transforming data. There are other types of transforming by logarithmic transformation or square rooting or whatever to make data look more, behave more normal. Um, actually, that's a source of great discussion and uh, arguing uh, in the literature about whether to transform your data to make them look more normal or not to transform data. As I said before, um, the control chart is very robust for deviations uh, from the assumption of normal data. So in, in most cases, you will not need to transform your data. The, the control chart would work as well, even with very skewed data like exponentially distributed data. But in some, some type of control charts, that's actually the basis. The G chart for rare events are based on, on uh, the geometric distribution and the T chart for rare events, uh, measuring time between event, events is actually using a transformation to take uh, this uh, very skewed uh, time to event distribution to make it look more normal. So I would not say that's a test for, for um, special courses, but that's more a technique for creating a, a symmetric distribution, not to have too many false signals in, in your data. Thank you for that comment. Maybe we could discuss it uh, more later on. Any more comments, suggestions, any complaints about the pace or the content of this? Okay, I suggest we take five. Uh, so I'll be back at 11, sorry, yeah, 11, 11, 11. We'll continue 11, 11. Is that okay? Thanks. Uh, regardless. I noticed that some of you regard yourself as novices in R, uh, and that's interesting. I would I would particularly like to hear from you at the end of this workshop um, how how this uh, this has been. Uh, have I been able to target you, you, or have you struggled to uh, to follow along? And actually, what do you mean by a novice? Uh, uh, I felt like an R novice for several years, even uh, when I used R a lot, but some people might think that a novice is just someone who has um, never ever used R before, so um, that would be interesting. But now uh, I will go back to R Studio, and uh, actually uh, we have finished the first part of this uh, assignment. Uh, and we have this discussion of how to increase the chart sensitivity to minor to moderate shifts in data. And now we will move, move on to the next part. And uh, what I'm going to do is I will take this um, and move it down here. So the next part, we will be adding runs analysis and that would be extra uh, checks or extra rules to detect uh, minor to moderate shift in data. And as we discussed, there are many, many rules out there and use, uh, please use the ones that you uh, feel um, are suited for, for the job. I will introduce you to runs analysis the way I do it. Um, also because um, uh, the rules I use are not that, um, are not that well known in the uh, SPC community and actually they are quite easy to work with and have, have some advantages. And they are at least as good as the Western electric rules. Uh, they, have, uh, they have been studied in detail and they compare to the Western electric rules and they are a, a, a bit simpler to, to work with. Um, so that's what I'm going to introduce you to. Now look at this run chart, or sorry, this control chart. 
um, it's obvious that something has happened, that the process mean is no longer zero. It has moved up here. And we want to detect that. And one of the rules we discussed is that we, if we have unusually many data points on the same side of the center line, that would be unusually many consecutive data points, that we would take that as a signal. This, this is uh, the same as throw, tossing a coin and getting the same results many, many times in a row. So the question is, how long should a run be? A run is defined as one or more data points uh, uh, following each other on the same side of the center line. How long should a run be before we, uh, we declare it a signal of non-random variation? Um, and in real life, uh, th there is a fixed rule from the Western Electric rule, say if you have eight or more data points in a row, that would be a signal that the process may be changing. And that's a very good uh, rule for everyday use, and it works well if you have between, between 20 and 30 data points. But in reality, um, uh, the limit for what would make an unusually long run depends on the number of data points. If you have 1,000 data points, you should not be surprised to find 10 or even 12 data points in a row on the same side of the center line. And on the other hand, if you only have 12 data points, a, a run of eight would be very unusual. You, you would never pick up uh, that kind of signal. So I use a, a rule that adapts to the total number of data points. In this chart, we have 24 data points. And the rule I use uh, declares that if you have more than eight data points in a row on the same side of the center line, that would be, um, uh, that would suggest that data is shifting. But, um, but, but this rule adapts to the number of data points. So if you have more data points or fewer data points, the, the limit for what is unusual changes. Okay, so runs analysis is about uh, runs. And a run, as I said, is a um, one or more consecutive data points on the same side of the center line. So here we have a run of one data point above another run of one below and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14 data points in a row above and one below, three above, one below, three above. That's the runs analysis. We're simply counting the runs. And to do that with R, um, we use a, a function for run length encoding. Uh, but first we have to, sorry, I'll move this down. First, we have to convert our y values to whether they are above or below the center line. Um, and, by do, and, and, and by doing that, we use the sine function in R, sine of the difference between y and the center line. In this case, the center line is zero, but in other cases, it might, be, it might not be zero. So we, we, we simply transform our, our y values to either one or negative one, depending on whether they are above or below the center line. So that's the first step in runs analysis to transform our data into uh, one or two values below or above the center line. We will assign this to, uh, to a variable called runs. And the next we do is that we do a run length encoding of this runs uh, vector. RLE stands for run length encoding. You can see the help file here. Um, An RLE function produces a, a list with two uh, components. One is the length of runs. So the length, the first run has length one. It consists of one data point. The next consists of one data point. Then we have a, a, a run of 14 data points and so on. The values of the runs have, uh, are encoded in the values uh, vector of the, of the result list. But we're only interested in, in the lengths and we'll get that by doing this. So we have in total one, two, three, four, five, six, seven runs in this, uh, in this plot. And here are the length of the runs. And the longest run is 14. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven runs in total. 
and the longest one is 14. And those are the parameters we need for our runs analysis. Let's assign this back to the, um, to the, uh, the variable called runs. We, 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 we want to know also the num total number of data points. We know that it's 24, but actually um, you have to exclude data points that are, that are uh, situated precisely on top of the center line. If any data point equals the center line, we, we will not count it because it's, not, uh, it's, it's, either, it's neither above or below. We have to, to fix that before we move on. So runs that equals zero should be excluded. And I just have to check my cheat sheet here to make sure I do this correctly. So we assign, we remove any zero values from the from the runs vector. In this case, that doesn't have any effect because no data point would be exactly zero, uh, but uh, it, it might be in, in the future. And then we need to find the longest run. No, sorry, we need to find the number of, of observations. And that is simply the sum of runs. So we have 24 data point here, and we will assign this to a, a vector called n ops number of observations. Next, we want to find the longest run, and that would be the max, the maximum value of runs, and that is 14, as you can see. We'll assign that to a object named longest run. And we want to know the number of runs. Uh, and that would be the length of the runs vector. So there are seven runs in total here. We would call that n runs. And for, um, for use with my uh, uh, runs rules, we need to know not the number of runs, but the number of times the curve, the line crosses the center line. It's a lot easier to work with that parameter than the number of runs. The number of crossings follow a binomial distribution, which makes it very easy to work with uh, and doing statistical tests on. So this has seven runs and there are six crossings. So the number of, sorry, crossings is one less than the number of runs. We call that number of crossings. Um, I, will, I will break in very short early so you can keep up with it. But this is the basis of, of our runs analysis. Doing this, we end up with the parameters we need to use because we need to compare the longest run with the with the um, with the cutoff value for unusually long runs, and we need to compare the number of crossings with what would be unusually few crossings. You can see if runs get longer, if the data shifts in any directions away from the center line, the 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 graph will will cross fewer and fewer times as we move away from the center line. So long runs, unusually long runs, or unusually few crossings of the center line would be signals of shifts in data. So I'll give you, uh, I'll give you time to, uh, to repeat this. Uh, in your code, after sigma signal, um, you should, you should uh, make these calculations and I will prettify them so it's easier for you to, uh, to see what's going on. And um, please go ahead and do this. You may of course uh, name your, your variables, whatever you like, uh, but it, it might be a good idea to use the same names I use so, so uh, you can uh, follow along the rest of the day. So this is our runs analysis. I'll make a note of that. Okay. So please go ahead 
and raise your hand when you're done. Um, and we'll continue from that. And don't hesitate to uh, speak up if you have any questions. Does anyone know if we will get new mugs for the conference next week? I've not heard anything. It's a very good question. My husband was clearing out our cups. You know, you always collect them over time and we give them to charity shops. And yeah. he was going to give away my NHSR one. It's like, that's not happening. He said, well, you don't use it very no. often because it's my NHSR mug. Yeah, this is, this is a Shocking. very valuable item. Also, yes. we need hex stickers. Uh, yes, I, I have a hex sticker on my laptop. Of, unfortunately, it's on the other side of the of the lid, so you can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have um uh, a bit of a problem if people have like organizational laptops and putting the stickers on there. So I gave a few of mine to my daughter, and she stuck them to a cardboard file instead. But I think she <laughs> gave me my NHSR one back. She claims oh. some other pretty ones, but not that one. I think. Yes, we do. Maybe just like cloth badges as well, like the scouts have and the brownies and guides. I'd like that. I'm just going to ask about the cups actually in the Slack group. That well, maybe that's great. Maybe you also needed some time to to have a break and to uh, to catch up. Uh, I hope you are still uh, following along in in this exercise. Oh, I need to share my screen. Um, you have some. Uh, there are lots of hands up. That's because you have finished, or because you have um, have questions. Uh, no, we have finished. I asked people to put them finished. So that is very very good, and I'll. Just look at the chat. There are um, okay. That's just about me. I didn't know. I don't know what happened, but uh, I I got a serious disconnection. I had no contact to the internet at all, even though everything seemed to work. But so I had to restart everything. Okay. Um, are you ready to move on? Um, oh, uh, Zoe, I have. I'm not able to share my screen. Can you fix that? Mm make me a co-host or something. Zoe, can you hear me? I can't hear you. Um, <coughs> I'm coughing, <laughs> try it again. Oh okay. yeah, that's okay. Um, I, I am unable to share my screen. It should do it now. Let's see, I'll try again. Yeah, can you see my screen? Great. Then um, I'll try and pick up. Um, hope I remember where we got to. We talked about the first step in runs analysis, and there are there are there are really three parameters we are looking for: the number of observation and the longest run, and then the number of crossings. Those are the three parameters we need to uh, to know in order to detect whether the num the, the the number of crossings is unusually low, which would be a signal of a shift in data. Or if the longest run is unusually long, that would also be a signal of, of the uh, data shifting uh, in, in our process. So how do we find the limits, the limits, the upper limit for longest run and the lower limit for number of crossings? Uh, there are, uh, the longest run, uh, the distribution of longest run has been studied in detail. 
through many many years and um, unfortunately uh, there is no closed form expression of this distribution there is a, a rule of thumb uh, saying that uh, that the upper limit the approximate 95 percentile of longest runs is now it's the base two logarithm of number of observations plus three. So you can see here the number 7.58 and so on. And we will round this number to the nearest integer. This is a rule of thumb. Let's say in a run chart with 24 data points, it would be unusual to observe a run longer than eight data points. Uh, those of you who are working with the NHS recommended rules for unusually long runs may think that this is a very high number. In fact, this is the right number to use. Uh, any number uh, much lower than, than this would, uh, would give you too, far too many false alarms. And I will talk more about that in my plenary talk uh, next Tuesday. But for now, please simply take my word for it, this is a, a reasonable upper limit that would signify unusually long runs. And we will save this to the parameter um, longest run max. That would be the maximum value. The lower limit for number of crossings, that is the, uh, a, a number of crossings so low that it would would, would uh, suggest that data are shifting, may be taken from the uh, binomial distributions. The, um, the number of crossings will follow a binomial distribution with, um, with uh, n minus, with, with, with um, a distribution for uh, a number one less than total number of data points. If you don't understand what I'm saying, don't worry, uh, just take my word for it. You would use the Q binom function to get that number. And we are looking for the, the fifth percentile of this distribution for one less than the number of observations and with a uh, success probability of 0.5. And by accident, um, the limit for the lowest number of runs that would, that, that would be unusual is also eight when you have 24 data points. Um, and we will call this n crossings minimum. So this is the lower limit for number of crossings. These two numbers are the limits for a signal using uh, uh, the rules, the runs rules I suggest. And together, uh, these two uh, tests equal the Western electric rules in sensitivity and specificity. So now we have these uh, parameters. And then the next thing we need to do is simply to compare the longest run to the maximum value and the number of crossings to the minimum value. So this is a runs test. Is the longest run, is that greater than the expected value? or this uh, vertical line means or. So either the longest run is too long or the number of crossings is below, is too low. Let's see what this test, actually this test is true. And we knew that because the longest run is too long and the number of crossings uh, is, is too low for this to be a random process centered around zero. And, and that fits because we have actually, I think we made it a one. Let's see if this one signals. We can run it a few more times. Here you have again a signal, an unusually long run and unusually few crossings of the center line. Now, before we move on, I want to make sure that everybody is on board. Uh, don't uh, worry if you if you don't get um, uh, the uh, the theory behind these calculations. They are based on statistical theory 
but take my word for it. And if you want to understand better, then read my papers or read the literature that is listed in, in my papers. This is a, a, um, a practical way of finding uh, limits for unusually long runs and unusually few crossings. And if either of these turns out to be true, it would be a signal that this process is changing. So uh, let me see uh, some hands, if you have uh, anything I need to explain better or write in the chat. I think that means that everybody has either left the building or uh, is good to go. So we'll, we'll, we'll continue. This is our test. This is our runs test. So let's call this the runs signal. Uh, we had the sigma signals. Now we have the run signal and that's only one value. The run signal is either true or false depending on whether uh, there are unusually long runs uh, or unusually few crossings. And um, to visualize the result of the runs analysis in a chart, I simply uh, use, uh, I, I color the center line according to this, uh, using the same principle as before, runs signal plus one. See? Here we have an example of, uh, of, of a, a process with a shift. We know there's a shift in, we introduce the shift, but it doesn't cross the control limit, but the center line gets red because one of these tests uh, turned out to suggest that the non-random variation is present. Um, I also, for the colorblind, I, I, um, uh, I use the same principle for the line type. So, oh, sorry, that was wrong. It's this one. Line type is runs signal plus one. So now, if there's a is, if there's a, if there's either two two long runs or two few crossings, the center line will be dashed and red. And if we reset the center to back to zero, we see that it's black. Once in a while, we'll get a signal even if no change has occurred. Uh, and that goes both for the sigma signal and the run signal. But together with the sigma signal and the run signal, we should expect um, a, this is a false positive runs analysis. Uh, and that will happen in, a, in approximately um, five to 7% of the time. That's a false positive rate of, uh, of the runs test. And that equals the false positive rate of the sigma signal. That would happen in about um, about five, six, eight percent of the times without controlled uh, limits. So I suggest that now you um, uh, work this into your program. Uh, you have the runs analysis, and then you have the limits, and you have the runs signal, and then you. I'll see if it can fit. Yeah. Yeah, we can fit it in one screen. As we move on, we might have problems fitting the whole function in. in the, this is a runs analysis. Finish that, and then add uh, add these parameters to the um, uh, to the center line. Okay. Um, so please uh, do that and raise your hand and, and uh, let, it, uh, let it stay raised until everybody is uh, ready to move on. When you are finished, you might rerun the code many times to find out how often you get a false positive signal. That's the next assignment.
does anyone, uh, anybody have problems uh, implementing this this code? Then speak up or or chat. Okay, I don't see any more hands popping up, um, so um, I would uh, I will continue. Um, I posted a question in the in the chat. I want to know what would be a good time for lunch break. I don't know what you are used to. Uh, in my country, we usually break around twelve, but um, uh, we can do whatever suits you. Um, and then there was a question from Matthew. Could you uh, expand on that? A false positive rate of 5% is quite high. Do you have anything to uh, Oh, uh, hi. Um, I'm just thinking in terms of the, the run length analysis, which one was that one for? Um, the longest run maximum level you said that was about a 95% confidence for the longest run. Um, is is that going to start triggering? Uh, is that going to cause false positives 5% of the time? Or is that uh, not quite as bad as that? Uh, actually, it's worse than that. Uh, if you combine the longest run and the and two, two or few crossings, you will get, depending on the number of data points in the chart, these rules are... Uh, are the false positive rate is not fixed. Actually, it moves with the number of data points, but because you adapt to the number of data points, it will stay around um, uh, five to eight percent false positive rate. Um, and um, uh, you are asking, is this too high? Should we should we uh, um, uh, should we tighten or rather increase the limits so we will have fewer positive false positives? What do you think? Um, uh, for me, I'm thinking if I generated like 50 charts from 50 different health indicators and a certain portion always came back, uh, you know, if we could say that, oh, there's always a certain level of, of false positives of that high, I think customers would be kind of annoyed at us rather than making something a bit more uh, certain. Yeah. Um, and um, in fact, uh, uh, the reason for teaching you this is that that you you may you can pick your own limits for this. Um, Walter Schuhart uh, talked about the uh, the three sigma limits. You know the, the the control limits. They were positioned where they are because he found it useful, not because they fit some theoretical um, statistical some some statistical theory. And uh, again, these rules for longest runs, uh, th these runs rules, um, I have used these for many years and I find them useful. Remember, the, the control chart is not, um, is not uh, for proving anything. It is to help us make decisions on where, whether we should investigate what's going on in our process. So a false positive signal simply means uh, try to find out if anything unusual is going on and you might find out that there's this is just a random signal um, the other way around if if you if you tighten the limits you will have fewer false positives but you will also have fewer true positives so you decrease the sensitivity of the chart so this is a trade-off between false positives and and true positives and I have studied that in detail. And if you're interested, please read some of my papers I have listed, um, especially one where I test a different, uh, different rules for runs analysis. Uh, the rules that NH NHS recommend, they, are, they have a false positive rate around, now hold on, around 50%. That's what you're dealing with in your daily lives, unless NHS has uh, has um, uh, uh, changed the rules uh, 
uh, lately. The NHS and the IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, promote rules that have a false positive rate around 40 to 50 percent. And that's great if you want to, uh, to find changes, even if they are not there. But it's not great if you want to be, to be true to your, your data. So this is a discussion we could have uh, all day long, and there are, uh, there are no fixed uh, true answers. Pick your rules. If you want to, um, to, to have uh, uh, a higher um, specificity, you should increase these numbers. So you should maybe increase the three. It doesn't have <laughs> to be a whole number. And if you want to, um, to uh, decrease the false positive rate from the crossings test, you should decrease this one to say 0.5 or whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But these two limits, these limits, I have been using those for years. And in my opinion, they work very well, especially if you teach your users that, that, that they are not, you're not trying to prove anything. You're trying to get the, the control chart to help us find out whether we should look for special causes or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. That's yeah, very helpful. That's satisfactory, yeah. Yeah, okay. What about lunch break? When will you have your lunch break? Zoe, you decide. Well, I think this is a nice natural conclusion. Um, 12 is not unusual for some people. Some people have started really, really early, uh, not like me turning up late. But um, if everybody's okay, I think maybe about it's only four minutes away, that might be okay for people. So, so in 24 minutes, you say, or should we take it? Oh, in four minutes. Oh, in four, yeah, in four yeah. minutes, it's 12 o'clock. Okay. So then we'll break for a half an hour. Is that enough for you? Or does anyone need a, a three quarters or a, or a full hour? A, a half an hour is okay with JR. Uh, if nobody protests, we'll, we'll break uh, in a few minutes and meet again at 12.30. Okay, that's decided. So you can see here, um, we have actually finished um, this part of the assignment. We have added runs analysis to our chart. And we have discussed um, the sensitivity and the specificity. Sensitivity means how good is the chart to uh, um, discover when changes have happened. That is when the mean has changed in the process we're looking at. Specificity is how good is it uh, as not detecting signals that are not really there. So that's the balance we need to, uh, we need to, to strike. And uh, when we come back, we will start on uh, on the next. Now it gets exciting. I, I expect this is what you've all been waiting for. How can we make the control chart calculate uh, the limits from the data we put into the control chart? And we will start with the eye chart. And if you haven't read Mohammed's article on how to construct eye charts, in, in his article, this is called the XMR the XMR chart. I call it the I chart. Actually, the XMR uh, chart is two charts, the X chart and the MR chart. Um, so uh, you might want to refresh on, on the formula for creating control limits in the I chart before we, we move on. And then we'll start building a function that can do all the control charts, um, all the basic control charts. There are four basic control charts. Uh, I'm sorry, but, but uh, I find it easier to remember if I if I name them in this order. I C U P. Um, uh, those are the four basic control charts that we will be working with today. So should we break for lunch now? And um, uh, I will take this and move it down so we are ready for for the next session. Here we go. Welcome back. Are you ready? So is ready. Okay, so Grace is ready. Vicky, thanks, thanks, thanks. <clears throat> Let's continue. Um, well, before we continue, uh, any questions, comments, suggestions from uh, the morning? 
speak up now or hold forever and so on. Nobody has anything to say. I take it as a good sign. So um, I'll share my screen. Um, we have come quite, uh, I'll also switch off my video, sorry. Can't I do this from here? Okay, I won't. Um, uh, we've come far. We have created a, a pretty advanced control chart that tests for individual data points uh, further away from the center line than three standard deviations or three sigma as, um, as it's called. And at the same time, take uh, tests for um, unusual runs that would be unusually long runs or unusually few runs suggesting a change in process mean over time. The next step is to make the, uh, the control chart calculate its own center line and control limits based on the, on the principle uh, explained in Mohammed's uh, paper. So here's a question for you. What parts of the script do we need to change in order to add an empirical center line and empirical control limits. Um, you can uh, write your suggestions in the chat. No suggestions? What parts of the script? You can simply name the lines, um, the code lines we need to change. No suggestions. Yeah. Line number 23 suggested by Vicky. You're absolutely right to come to calculate an empirical center line. We will not be using zero, but we will be using the actual mean of the Y values. What do we need to change uh, in order to, um, to base the control limits on empirical values from the data? You may write your suggestions in the chat. <clears throat> uh, would we need to find the standard deviation? Exactly. And why is that? There's no, there's no mention of the standard deviation in, uh, in this code. Yeah, rows 24 and 25. Um, that's because actually the control limits, um, in, in our case, we have used fixed values, but in in reality, the control limits are plus and minus three times the standard deviation. And in this function R norm, the standard deviation is by default one. So if the standard deviation of uh, is one, we don't need to do anything. But if the standard deviation is not one, we need to multiply the center line. So we need to base the center line on the actual mean of the data point. And we need to base control limits on the actual standard deviation in the data. Um, watch out because this standard deviation is not the usual one. You will not use the, uh, the, uh, the base R uh, standard deviation function to calculate the standard deviation. If you simply take the cool standard deviation of all data in your data set, that would include both the uh, random and the non-random parts of variation. That would be the common cause and the special cause variation. If there are any shifts in your data along the way, that would inflate the standard deviation. So we cannot base the standard deviation on the, on the simple cool standard deviation of all our data. But the mean of the data point, this parameter, um, we can actually calculate that using simply the mean of y. So here is y. 
and uh, that would be 24 data points and then the mean would be in this case 0 0.015 and so on the standard deviation we need to calculate that how would you do that any suggestions from the paper by Mohammed uh, you might want to speak this one out uh, rather than uh, writing writing it in the chat any suggestions how would we calculate the standard deviation of uh, the the, the um, you could say the, the standard deviation of the random variation or the common cause variation in y okay i'll write it for you and then i'll try and explain um i think i'll do first we need to do to calculate the pairwise differences in the y. So if we have 24 numbers in the y vector, we will have 23 differences. That would be differences between a pairs, uh, consecutive data points. So the difference between the first two points is this one. Uh, it's about 0.98. Uh, that doesn't fit. Oh, I haven't plotted it. Sorry. Uh, so we can't we can't look at the plot. But but wait a minute. So with these uh, twenty four random normal numbers in the y vector, the difference between the first two is point one six, and the difference between the next two is uh, negative one. 0.46 and so on. We need to convert these to the absolute numbers, that is removing the negative signs. So these are the absolute difference or the moving difference between data points. And then we need to get the mean of these numbers. The, the, so this is the average moving range. And as you see, it's pretty close to one, which is the uh, standard deviation. But in order to um, to convert this to the true standard deviation, we have to divide by a statistical constant. And don't ask me to explain this. I can show you empirically that it, it fits. It's, this is simply the relation between the true standard deviation in data and the average moving range is what is what we calculated here. So this number is the empirical standard deviation in our data. Okay, so now hold on. We have changed something in the, in these three lines. We have exchanged the zero with a with a simple m for the mean, and we have added the standard deviation to the calculation of of uh, control limits. Let's see if this works. I rerun the code, and now you can see in the plot that the center line is no longer exactly zero it's actually the actual mean of the y values and the control limits are no longer exactly negative three and, and positive three. So this is your eye chart. And um, in fact, uh, a lot of people use only eye charts for all their SPC work. So um, if you want, you can leave the workshop now. This is all you need uh, for all your future SPC needs. Um, if you want to learn how to calculate uh, to how to create other types of control charts, then you should uh, hang on. Uh, I suggest you, uh, you you do these changes to your code. These are the lines you need to, um, uh, to change in order to get this to work. Okay, and raise your hands when you are finished and ask any questions in the, uh, in the chat.
translation of the oh sorry waiting for the recording are there any questions uh, about the calculation of the mean and especially the standard deviation uh, again this is something you might not grasp immediately but believe me this is how it's done and you uh, can read the literature to uh, to get a deeper understanding of it uh, any questions yeah is uh, 1.128 the value to help calculate the empirical standard deviation routinely routinely or just for this data set this is an empirical this is a statistical constant that goes for all data sets it's it's a way of converting the moving averages averages uh, sorry the moving uh, ranges in the data sequences to the standard deviation um, so this goes for all data uh, sets and again if you have data that are very um, unnormally distributed if they're very asymmetric this uh, will not be completely true uh, but it works in practice the eye chart as we have created here is a very robust chart also for asymmetric data not from a normal distribution any more questions? Then should we move on? I will move on now. Uh, and the next ta uh, task is to, sorry, I delete this. The next chart is to make a run chart. You may, I hope you're familiar with run charts. Run charts are simply control charts without control limits. Um, where we uh, apply runs tests, that is runs analysis. Uh, as you have seen, the uh, runs analysis is pretty good at detecting minor to moderate persistent shifts in data. That is a shift that lasts for more than a few data points. If your data shifts persistently, the runs analysis would pick it up a lot quicker than the control limits. The control limits are very good for detecting large shifts in data and also potentially uh, large uh, transient shifts. If you have a sudden shift in data that goes away, a run chart will not detect it, but a control chart would detect it. Um, and, uh, but but in, in healthcare improvement, we are actually always looking for persistent shifts in data. So the run chart is my preferred tool for quality improvement because I'm always looking for persistent shifts in data. And these run tests I have introduced you are actually a lot more sensitive to persistent minor and moderate shift than are the control limits. This may be new to uh, some of you who have heard, uh, it has been postulated for years and years that the control chart is a more sensitive tool than the run chart. That is not true. The control chart is a useful addition to a run chart if you need to be able to identify large, possibly transient shifts in data. But for healthcare improvement in general, all you need is a run chart that will signal minor to moderate persistent shifts. Um, do I make myself clear if anyone needs uh, me to explain this better or maybe needs Zoe to explain it better, then please uh, say so now before we move on. Thankfully everyone's quiet on that, me, <laughs> me explaining it. <laughs> everyone's quiet. So Zoe, do you have anything to add that might help understand my explanation? <laughs> No, I don't really think so. I mean, the way I use these charts is, um, as you are suggesting in this, is to use it as a signal to go and investigate. So it's not absolute, uh, it's not proof of anything. So I think that is part of it. So that you start with the run charts first. Oh, we've got a hand up now. There we go, my explanation was so poor. <laughs> <laughs> JR. Yeah, sorry, I, I got a question. So uh, when you say make a, when you use a median based run chart, do you use a median for both the median, which is line 23, uh, or do you also use median for line 24 where you're doing the standard deviations? Uh, I, I didn't hear the last part. Do I use the median for length what? I didn't hear that. Uh, do, do you apply median uh, as, uh, as a central limit? So that's line 23. Or do you also use median for line 24? 
I use I use the median uh, uh, regardless of how many data points I have. Uh, just like just like with the mean, I simply take the median of all data points. So if I have twelve data points, that would be the median of of twelve of these twelve data points. If I had a thousand data points, I would take the median of those thousand. The mean and the median are actually two sides of the same coin. It, they are expressions of the central tendency in data. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah. So so you don't use median in line twenty four. So line twenty four still remains the mean, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. This line, I, I thought you were talking about data data points twenty four and twenty three. No. Um, to to add a median based run chart, I need to change these two. That's all I need to change. Um, and I'll show you. Um, we'll put it below this, so that would be what comes up in the chart. The mean is the the the, the center line is no longer the mean of the data points, but the median, and the standard deviation. Is not available because we don't use control limits in. Uh, yes, we don't use control limits in, in run charts. Uh, I'll make some room for this. So if I run this, I will get a run chart. I did got an error. Can anyone spot what's the error? Need oh, we can't see the plot. I think the plot's um yeah, behind. Plot because th there isn't. Any oh, sorry, plot. I'm looking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why, why, why didn't I get any plot? What's wrong with this? need finite while in values. It is this one. Can you see this? We, we took the range of the Y values and the control limits. Because the control limits are in A, the Y limits will be also be in A. How do we fix this? Just speak up. We have to disregard in A, sorry. We have to disregard the uh, missing values. Here's our run chart. This is a median based run chart. The center line is now the median of the values. And all we had to change was these two lines into these two lines. And then we get a run chart. Okay. Uh, I want to when I do this in, in, in production, I want of course, I want to be able to switch between the type of control charts. Um, that I use. So uh, I will make this a parameter. Uh, so uh, let's say we have a parameter that the chart is, uh, by default, it should be an I chart. And then I, um, I, uh, I use this construction, if chart equals I, You should use this calculation. Oh, sorry. Else, if chart equals run, use these calculations. Now, I have decided that the chart parameter is a Y. So now we, we see what happens. Yeah, I got a, an, an I chart with control limits. I could change this to a run, and now I got a control chart. So please do this, make a parameter called chart, and then uh, make this construction of if and if else uh, calculations of uh, depending on the chart parameter. And raise your hand when you are ready to move on. I just noticed then that you moved some code really neatly. Were you holding down a key when you moved, shifted it down, like a shortcut key or something? You know. You mean, you mean I aligned the code? No. Uh, well, there was the alignment. That was really nice. But there was also you moved some code from a couple of lines up and then moved them in oh, yeah. its entirety yeah. down, and you could see it move. Yeah. Uh, first, the alignment part. If I want to to align my code beautifully, I simply mark everything and then I press Control I. That's a function of RStudio to neatly align everything using Control I. Um, that's useful. If I want to move code around, I place the cursor on the line I want to move and then hold down the Alt key. Is that the way you pronounce it? Yes. Alt? Yeah. And then I use uh, arrows up and down. Oh, wow. Neat, isn't it? Mm, thank yeah. you. 
And can I ask a question between when you would use your mean or your median? Because um, I know that these are on the basis of processes, but we've often looked at them in terms of uh, like numbers of beds or, or say, um, I'm thinking specifically because I work in mental health or with mental health data, time in in our beds can be incredibly variable, like from a couple of days to months. And a median is more preferable for that data. But what should I be considering on the basis of the type of thing that I'm looking at, or maybe the statistics when I'm choosing between a run chart or an SPC chart mm. in that context, particularly for those kind of bed length of stay is what I'm thinking of, yeah, length of stay very ranges. Very good, yeah. very good question. When to use the mean and when to use the median. Um, as a starting point, uh, I use uh, always use the mean for control charts. Uh, and that's because that's how they, they, they used to work. But you could use the median if you wanted to. But for control charts, I would use the mean of the, all the data points. For run charts, I always use the median for the reason you, you stated that the median is a much more robust measure of the central intensity of data, regardless um, if, if the data uh, are very skewed, like, uh, like waiting time, that almost all times data, time in bed, time uh, to admission, time to waiting time, to some, uh, times data are often uh, highly skewed. Uh, and the mean is not a very good expression of, of the central tendency. So for time data, I would use the, the median. But in fact, uh, as I said before, I always start out using run charts. And, um, uh, and in a run chart, I use the median. Oh, and if you use a run chart that is median based, you will never ever have to worry about the distribution of data because data by definition will be uh, symmetrically distributed around the median. So, so the median, median is a safe choice. There's only one uh, but about the, the mean, and that is if you have chunky data, that, that many of your data have the same values. That might be many zero value or many 100% values. Or if you have count data uh, that, that uh, where more than half the data points have the same value, then the, the, the center line will by definition be this uh, value. And the runs analysis um, gets, uh, gets uh, often uh, unusable. Uh, so if you have chunky data or data where more than half your data points have the same value, the runs analysis may not be useful. And in those cases, it might help to, to use the mean because that will, it will it move away from all these uh, identical values. Did that answer your question? It did. Thank you very much. That reassures me that run charts are very useful um, very all the time and even probably uh, so you start with the run anyway, but it also is very useful when you're working with such. If, if, I have seen, Grace, you have a hand up and you will get the word in a, a minute. Um, uh, if your run chart signals non-random variation, in fact, that's a signal that it would make, make no sense to make a control chart. If your process is unstable, it makes no sense to calculate the, the mean. Imagine two cars driving. One is uh, speeding from, from uh, zero to a uh, hundred kilometers an hour in 10 seconds. And the other car is stopping from hundred kilometers an hour to zero in 10 seconds. Um, how would you compare these two cars? Which of these cars runs the fastest? fastest? They have the same average speed, but the average is, is meaningless because uh, data uh, are moving in these processes. So if your run charts signals non-random variation, it makes no sense to uh, calculate the mean. And then it makes no sense to calculate, to use a control chart. So the run chart is your, your, your first, should be your, your, your first analysis, your first test of your data. Um, likewise, for your, those of you who are clinicians, if, if an ordinary old-fashioned x-ray uh, shows that the, that the leg uh, is broken, there's a fracture, you won't use a, uh, a, a spiral CT scan because you already got the answer. The x-ray proved that the, there's a fracture and we don't need to make any more analysis uh, uh, for the purpose of the diagnosis. There might be other reasons to do it. So run charts is your, is your uh, tool of 
your first choice tool. Okay. Um, Grace, you had a hand up. Uh, yeah, no, you've answered my question. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's great to be able to answer questions I had even haven't heard. Uh, that that's great. Okay, so. Um, uh, Make a media-based runtime. Well, we finished this part of the of the uh, lesson. Uh, should we take a five-minute break? Um, I I expect that we will have a, a maybe fifteen-minute break later in the afternoon, so you can make a new pot of tea or whatever. Um, and then I expect that we will end no later than four thirty. We might end before that if we are if we are quick. Uh, but if any of you wants to hang around. Um, uh, after hours uh, for a pint or a chat, uh, I'd be happy to uh, to stick around. So uh, just for the your your planning. Uh, um, okay. uh, sorry to ask. Uh, just before you go, uh, could you share the um, the plotting code uh, for the the Y limit range? Uh, I think I missed that change. You know. Uh, the um, the fix. Yeah. The the range. That's a range function. If there are any. Uh, ah, yeah. Yeah, you need to you need to add to add this one. Uh, Na uh, rm that means remove missing values before calculating the, the range. Yep, yeah, that's why I missed. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great question. Yeah, now it gets uh, it gets uh, increasingly difficult difficult to uh, to have all the code in in one one view. Um, so tell me if I need to zoom uh, out again. Uh, I'll do that. But let's take uh, five minutes. Um, that would be 13.03. I will be back. OK. Are you ready? Any questions, suggestions, or problems? I was wondering if you could share, maybe copy the code and put it in the chat. I know it's quite long. It's just when I look at mine, my um, I keep getting a signal on my mean and median, and I think I've got something wrong in my code somewhere. <laughs> okay, um, can I give you a tip? Yeah. Uh, you, 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 you have the uh, um, the original file with the solutions in it. Uh -huh. I looked at uh -huh. the solutions. Uh -huh. Ah, solutions. And as I said, as it, uh, it, it's not illegal to, um, to cheat. Uh, this is not about remembering things. Uh, this is about understanding why things work the, uh, the way they do. But but maybe you should share your screen. Uh, okay, if there, yeah. If there's anything wrong with your code, or it could be that you are a special course yourself. <laughs> I'm a bit worried because I keep getting signals every time I run it. So I'm going to try and find it. Where is my screen? Maybe it's the whole screen I share. Oh, so you can see everything. Ah, can you see everything? That's a, busy, that's a busy screen. It's a big screen, isn't it? Hang on. Zoom is taking over everything, isn't it? So everybody can see everything. And I can't reach my cloud. Are you working in the cloud? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. Do you know how Just many of the participants who are using the cloud? Quite a few. I can, we had a quick look to see there's a few people, I think, I can see more people in the cloud than I can in my Zoom because I didn't update my Zoom. <laughs> so okay. um, that's that's interesting. Uh, well, I'm glad it worked because I uh, I use I have I have uh, we have talked about it. My experience with our cloud uh, are not good. Uh, I usually stay away from it when I can. Um, that's not because it's not a good idea, but because it often causes more problems than it solves. But if it's working now, um, it's very good. So what's your problem? I think every time I run this, my plot always has a broken okay. so mean or median, let, whichever I'm using. Let, 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 let's count. This is, the, this is a run chart. I see there are no control limits. And you have 24 data points. Is that right? Yes. So how, how many times does the line cross uh, the center line? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, you're quick. <laughs> there, there are not too few crossings. If there are fewer than eight, that would be a signal. How long is the longest run? One, two, three, four, five. So the longest run is five data points in a row. So this center line that has been uh, red and dash, it, that's a problem. This, mm. is, this is wrong. So it's your runs analysis that's wrong or the, or the, or the coloring of the, um, 
uh, of the uh, let's see number of crossings one leg uh, round log two in of this one yeah and let's see the code for coloring the center line for the and the run lo, hey, wait a minute longest oh, sorry. Run, longest run longest run max oh that's uh, the longest i think it's uh, your line number 42 mm -hmm. longest run max so so you, you need to delete everything after the max yeah and then uh, go be before max uh, you are actually testing whether the longest run is longer than longest run max so you need to write longest run dot run greater than <laughs> okay it. and then oh. I run, uh, uh, so so um longest run max is longer no sorry no i'm what i'm 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 confusing you have the longest run what you need to calculate is the longest run max and you have already done that so delete line number 42 ah That's oh so i'm problem. overwriting it oh i see simply that and then try and rerun the code i had an extra line on it oh no is that just luck mm. longest run well, and the, uh, oh, it's line number 42. Mm -hmm. the, the number of crossings should not be less than the uh, in crossings mean. So before in crossings mean you write in crossings. Uh, in, sorry, in crossings. In where? crossings, yeah. So put in crossing. Than. Is that right, sorry? Yeah, crossings, you need an S. Crossings. And less than. Oh. Ooh. Now, you have, now that's, that's your test. If either the uh, run is too long or the number of crossings is too low, try and rerun the code again. I mean, if I do it again. Yeah. Oh, that's better. I don't know what happened. Oh, there we go. That's the random yeah, signal. But, but now, Yay. now let's look. Can we find the signal? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, two, three, four, five. So in. There are only seven crossings in this one. That's the reason. So this is false positive. That's perfect. Great, thank you for that. <laughs> Great, anybody um, else having problems we could solve? Oh, I think somebody solved my problem there. <laughs> oh, is that somebody else? Is that an answer to what I was getting wrong? That's wonderful, oh, thanks. Yeah. Liam solved your problem. Thank you. Good. Okay, so. I will mute my video and I will start sharing. Yeah, perfect. Can you see my screen? Yes. That's a yes. Great. Now we have come uh, a long way. I have restructured the code. So the if starts with the run chart, you don't need to do that. So, but, uh, but I like to keep things in order and I always start with the run chart. And then we are going to build on this uh, and add all the other control charts. I see you P remember that that's the control charts we are going to build later on. But first I will move this code down below the next assignment so we can See what's in store for us. One function to rule them all. Now we want to build the, start building this SPC function. So rather than running the full code every time, we simply run uh, the SPC function that takes an argument, which is the Y values, and creates a, um, a, a, a chart. So we start here after we have defined our y values we start by making i don't know how many of you who have created functions before but it is quite simple this is the body of a function you assign a name or rather you assign a function to a name and this function is called SPC. And whenever I run SPC, this function will run. 
Okay. That's how we create functions. Um, and we will be using that for, for the rest of the day. We will, we will not be printing hello. Um, and now we'll move this end bracket down below. Sorry. There. Don't do the, this yet. I want to change. And then again, I align the code by uh, uh, control A to mark everything and then control I to uh, get the indentation right. So now we have a function that takes one parameter, one argument, which is Y, and then it uh, creates a plot. You can see I, uh, I run this function and when I do this, I get, sorry, I need to SPCY. Whenever I run SPCY, um, a new control chart has been, will be created. And if I want to make a run chart, I can do this. Uh, the next thing, uh, rather than uh, defining the chart type on a separate line, I want to make it an argument to my function. It won't work yet because it doesn't know what, what this argument is, but we will add it to the function um, definition chart equals run. So by default, we're setting a default value. By default, the SPC function creates run charts. Um, and then we don't need this line. And if we don't specify the chart, it will make a run chart. If we specify a chart, say an eye chart, it will make an eye chart. Did you see that? So, um, there's a lot going on here. I'll, I'll uh, try and repeat what I did. I started by creating the body of a function. SPC uh, is the name of the function, and we assign the function call to SPC with two arguments, y chart and run. And then we uh, uh, provide an open opening bracket and then put the rest of all this inside the opening bracket and then close the bracket. And then this is the, our test that everything works. Uh, I can't have this in, uh, in, in one screen. Maybe if I zoom out a bit, it will make things a little easier. Otherwise, you're allowed to look at the solutions, uh, but, but be aware that the solution is a complete solution. There's a lot more going on in the solution. Uh, try and make this um, and then again shout out if you need any help. I'll go get my.
Lindsay, you had a comment 10 minutes ago about the median. Is that my code or Zoe's code? Um, no, I think it was in Zoe's. In Doi's code, maybe with the FL statement, they both said it defined um, as the mean for both for Ron and I. Maybe I, I don't know. I, I thought that okay. it was Zoe. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's this line I have marked. It when you do a run chart, you do the median. If you do a control chart, you do the mean. Yeah. Thanks. But you're right. I'd got mean in both, so okay. I need to change yeah. that. So well spotted. Thank you. I had two problems. Wow. <laughs> I guess creating a function is a bit more involved than what we have been doing until now. And also you it's easy to lose to lose the um, the view of your code uh, when wrapping everything inside a function. Um, and in fact, you might want to in the future to split the function in in several sub functions, one function for doing sigma signals, one for doing the runs analysis, maybe even one for doing the calculation of uh, the center line and the standard deviation, depending on the, the type of run chart. But you could do that, that on your own afterwards. Uh, I'll give you a couple of more minutes and then we'll move on. I see only two hands. Uh, does that mean uh, that uh, the rest of you have finished or are you struggling? Oh, hands came up. Five hands. Matthew, Bruce, Dom, Jeanette and Sam. Are you having problems? No problem. And it. This is quite good. I, I, I didn't expect uh, people to be that fast of, uh, of coding. I know that uh, this code, when you look at it afterward, it seems pretty simple. But when building something from scratch, it's always uh, a lot more involved than, uh, than seeing the final results. So I'll move on now and um, we will have a, a longer break uh, around, should we say around two o'clock. And uh, those of you who, uh, who uh, haven't uh, finished all the assignments at that point, you might want to, uh, to uh, what do you say, keep up at that time. So now we have wrapped everything in a function and this function is named SPC. And this is how you create a function uh, you um, assign it to a name, SPC, and then you, uh, you use the function, which is called function, and the arguments go inside the parentheses, uh, and then the function body goes between these brackets. Uh, and everything that happens between the brackets is output when you call the function using the function name 
and then you provide the data needed for the function to do its work. Uh, and in this case, where the function um, is able to use either one argument or you could provide the second argument, which is uh, specifying that uh, the function should create a control chart. I will zoom in a bit again. Okay, so the next assignment is, let's see, we should add an optional X argument. What, what, why should we have an X argument? Right now we only have an I, Y argument and the Y values go on the Y axis. I want to add the opportunity to add an X variable. What would we want to put on the X axis? Uh, any suggestions? Oh, Matthew is uh, is fixing a server. <laughs> Date time. Matthew is back. Uh, exactly. In in uh, in run charts and control charts, we most often have dates or times on the x back uh, axis. Um, that may, may be dates, uh, weekday, Monday, Tuesday, and etc. It may be uh, week numbers or months or quarters. You would rarely see years in a control chart. Uh, when, you, when you're working with data that are based on yearly numbers, it has nothing to do with quality improvement. It might be useful for research and, and, and other things, but not for quality improvement. For quality improvement, you want a daily, a weekly, or a, at the least monthly data. So uh, we should add a, um, uh, the opportunity to be optional to add uh, values on the x-axis that are something different than simply the sequence of, of data points. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll start by adding the argument x. Okay, what happens if we uh, run, you have, you have, uh, you have to run the, the function body again before you can use the body, the body. So I have added the x as an argument and then I try to run the function and it complains that it's missing the y argument. Why is it missing the y argument? The y argument is here. It's because the y argument is the second argument. And we are providing something that the function thinks is the, the x argument. So let's create a vector of x values. Um, and I will simply create a sequence of dates. I'll take, uh, I'll take the sysdate function would give you the current date. And then I will subtract 24 numbers. So now we have an x value. These are 24 consecutive dates from, from 24 days ago until yesterday. And then I will provide that. Yeah, now it works, but we still don't have dates on the x axis. Why is that? Well, it's because we didn't tell the plotting function to respect the x and we have to do the same with all the plots plotting parts. So we have to add x to every um, uh, layer of the plotting and then rerun rerun everything and now we have dates on the x-axis. Please do that. First you add the x as an argument, then you create a, uh, a sequence of dates that you can test with this function. And if, if, if it doesn't work, uh, then you should restart your R by control, control shift 10, then everything will get wiped out. And then you can rerun everything by control shift enter or by sourcing. So add the X uh, argument as, uh, as a possibility in the SPC function. And as always, speak up if you have, if you're having problems. one hand, 11 to go. 
Thank you, Joey. Nearly halfway there. Good. If anyone's having problems, feel free to uh, share your screen and we'll help you. Jenny lost the color. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at that. Or maybe, Zoe, will you be able to help Jenny uh, in a breakout room? Yes, hopefully. <laughs> I was just thinking I, that sounds very similar to the problem I had. I don't, if it's... I don't know how to create breakout rooms, but uh, I you think should I... do your way around Zoom. <laughs> yeah, I can just... Okay, I think you'll see that I've opened a room called Need Help with a smiley face. Oh, I mean, Jenny, if you'd like to go in there, I can go and see if I can show you my code and um, work through it. I'll just pop in there if you're going. Okay, I'll have a look. See you in a bit. Anybody else having problems? Then we'll give uh, Zoe and Jenny a minute or two. And then we'll continue.
okay, will it be okay if we continue? Um, if no prot protests, I will uh, uh, point your attention to this, that the X argument should be optional. Right now it's mandatory. If you don't provide the X argument, you will get an error as before. It actually says the Y is missing with no default. So let's fix this by making not the X, uh, uh, making a default value, not for the X, but for the Y. And we will use null as a default value for Y. That means that by definition, the Y argument will be empty. So the first argument, if we only provide one argument, that will be taken as the values we want to plot. But if we provide two arguments, uh, the X and the Y argument, it should know that the first argument should go on the X axis and the second argument should go on the Y axis. And we will fix this by adding a if is, sorry, is, null, if the y values are empty, we will get the y values from the x. And then we will create artificial x values from the sequence of y's. This is a very simple trick to make a function respect one or two arguments. Let's see if this works. Now it works. We didn't have to provide the X argument. We could if we wanted to, and then we will have dates on the uh, on the uh, X axis. Or we could simply provide the Y values for the Y argument. And if we do this, it will create the Y values from the first argument, and it will create a new X argument. Uh, I know this is maybe a a bit convoluted also because uh, I'm not that good at English. So if anyone wants to give a better explanation of this or wants to ask, uh, do that now. Otherwise you may start implementing this. That's all, that's actually all you need to do to, uh, to make the X argument optional. I think we'll take a break of five minutes for you to finish this and for Zoe and Jenny to fix uh, uh, her color problem. And then I'll be back at uh, 1340. I know you're not accustomed to uh, times uh, at 13. So that would be 140 PM. Is that right? Um, so five minutes, four minutes break now. Okay.
Okay, everyone. Uh, uh, it seems there's something with uh, Jenny's code, uh, but but and Jenny needs to to uh, catch up. Please tell me and be honest. Uh, are there any other who need more time to catch up? I'd be perfectly happy to uh, to take a break for ten minutes to have everybody catch up and and recreate the function as it is now. Uh, or should we move on? Please help me ma make that decision. Does anyone need more time? We'll fix Jenny's code later. I'm good to wait and catch up. Okay, then let's let's take nine more minutes until ten to two, uh, and then we'll we'll uh, we'll start again. And you can use this as a break or to to catch up. Um, I don't think I'll be able to. Uh, make the full code fit my window but the most of it is here and if you need to see more then uh, then just ask or, or look in the cheat sheet from the uh, the original script okay okay we'll come back from break um any questions or comments at this point before we move on? Then we will move on and I will start to share my screen again. Is it working? No, it is not. There it is. I hope you, uh, I hope you got this far. Uh, a few of you have left for for other meetings, but I hope that you will um, stick around for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, I, I guess you you are starting to see uh, where we're heading. Um, we have created one function SPC which creates run charts or control charts. At the moment, we have only one type of control chart, and there are many many types of control charts out there for different purposes. And we will be uh, adding three more control charts to this, but in principle, you could build on this function indefinitely to uh, make uh, all other types of control charts. The basic idea of the control chart is to know the center of this process we're working with and to know the standard deviation. When you know have these two parameters, the center and the standard deviation, and the center, I say center rather than mean or median, because it could be the mean or the median. I guess we, we could say the average uh, expressed by either the mean or the median. Uh, but in theory, we could use other measures of central tendency like mode or whatever. Uh, but, but if you know these two parameters, you can make any type of control chart. Uh, the basic idea is that the center line is the center and the control limits uh, represent, uh, they, they are placed um, plus and minus three standard deviations away from the center line. That's the basic idea. So all we have to do to add more um, uh, uh, control chart types is that we need to add other calculations for mean and standard deviation. Uh, so this first one is I, and then I'll make room for the C chart. And I will make room for the U chart. And else, uh, sorry, if chart equals P. I see U P. Easy to remember, isn't it? So this is the this is the template we are going to work with when we are will be adding more control chart types and I don't think and we won't get any go any further today but you I I'm, I'm sure you could you could continue on your own to add other types of control charts although uh, I very rarely use control charts other than these four uh, it's extremely rare uh, that I use a G chart or T chart for rare events. Um, the X bar and S charts for 
measure data uh, is used very much in um, in production industry, but very little in in healthcare. In healthcare, most of our data are count data. We count events, we count patients, um, and so oh, that's an error here. Equals means should be two equal signs. In healthcare, most um, quality indicators are based on count data, and count data. Uh, that's for the C and the U and the P chart. The C uh, actually stands for count. So whenever we are counting events, um, usually unpleasant events like uh, deaths or complications or um, traffic accidents or whatever, we would use a C chart for that. Um, U charts are also for events of unpleasant things. If we, instead of counting um, uh, pressure ulcers, we want to uh, count pressure ulcers per something, say the number of pressure ulcers per 1,000 patient days, that would be a U chart. The U chart is for rates for, uh, and the C chart is for counts. Uh, the only difference between the U and the C chart is that this, the, the U chart has a denominator uh, like patient days or whatever. The P chart is one of the most widely used chart. P stands for proportion or percent. So whenever you have something expressed in percentages or proportions, you would use a P chart. And in Mohammed's paper, you have the formulas for all these uh, uh, control charts. And also in the, uh, in the uh, QI charts two package, there's a vignette explaining this and the appendix I have actually the formulas for all these charts if you if you need to look them up. And also for the for the G chart if you if you want to do that. But here is for the C chart and for the U chart and for the P chart. And uh, you see the principle is the same that you calculate the mean as a center line and then you add and subtract three times the standard deviation. And the only difference between these three charts is how to calculate the standard deviation. So um, but, but, but before we go on, I would, uh, now it becomes uh, more and more difficult to, uh, to simulate data that we will play with. So I will delete these and then I will import a data set I have created for the occasion. Um, that's, the, um, that's the data inside this file with the uh, surname RDS. And I will read in those files to a variable read rds is the function and then the name of the of the uh, file this one i read in and that now d d is a data frame uh, with with the these are artificial data i created these data from random numbers uh, depending on the type of data we are working with so the first column is an x column simply uh, the sequence from 1 to 25 24 and the uh, measure mimics some type of measure. This could be blood pressure or waiting times or whatever, anything that you measure. And the, the thing about measure data is that they usually have the decimals. You can, you can, you can if, if a number has decimals, it's usually a measure of some, something that you can measure on a, on a continuous scale. Measure data are rare in healthcare, as, as I said before, uh, at least in, in, uh, in, in quality improvement, they are, they are very common in, uh, in healthcare uh, as physiological parameters, blood pressure, weight, temperature, and whatever. Um, so this is, is simply a, a data set we could play around with. Then we have a month variable, simply artificial consecutive month for plotting something by month. It could be weeks or days or whatever. And then the next two columns, they, uh, they represent something that we would count the number of patients with some kind of complications. So six out of 78 patients experience this complication. So that would be something for a P chart, the proportion of patients that experience this. And the last two columns are represents events and the patient days. So this would be useful for counting um, uh, complications, not per patient, but per patient day. So this could be nine pressure ulcers in total by 127 patient days. 
or this would be hospital infections, nine bacteremias uh, in 127 patient days. So this is a data set you can play around with. Um, they're quite boring. Uh, there's random variation in, in everything, so you won't see any signals, but you can use it to test your, your functions that you get the expected uh, values out of these. Um, to, uh, to get to data in a data frame, say we wanted to, to plot a run chart of this measure variable, I would do like this SPC and then the name of the data frame, a dollar sign and then measure. That would give us a run chart of this measure. And because these data are fixed, we will get the same result every time we run the code. What if I write, simply write measure, you get an error because the SPC function doesn't know where to look for the measure variable. You need to tell it that it's inside this data frame. I guess this is, um, this is already known to, to most of you. And if we want to, uh, to provide the X value, we can do this. Okay, so um, for you now, I want to prepare this template for the rest of the gang of the uh, run of the uh, control charts. Don't fill in anything yet, and then um, uh, uh, read in this data set that we will play with the rest of the day. I think uh, five minutes should be enough. So I'll. I return in fourteen oh seven. Any questions? Good. Thanks. Okay, so now we have a data set. Oh, I have to minimize you all. We have a data set, uh, a data frame named D with some values to experiment with, with the uh, with I, C, U, and P charts. Um, we have prepared uh, the run chart and the, uh, where is it here? And the I chart. Um, the C chart is a C chart for counts, uh, counting events. And C chart is based on the Poisson distribution. If you are familiar with that, the Poisson distribution is a distribution that um, usually describes natural events that are randomly distributed in time and space. Um, Random events in time and space may be shooting stars or uh, radiation emissions, uh, bacteria in a blood sample, traffic accident uh, in a piece of road, or uh, pressure ulcers developing at the in-house patients or complaints popping up from time to time. Um, the idea of a random event is that it is equally likely to happen in any uh, very small amount of time. And when you have such events, um, uh, and in healthcare, uh, we, uh, we use C charts for complications, um, complication rates, if, if that's the, the case, um, then we could use C chart. And the C chart is very easy to work with. Um, the mean is, of course, as in the I chart, the mean of the, sorry, of the y values and the standard deviation. This is so simple, is simply the square root of the mean. So when I rerun, remember to rerun everything whenever you change something in your code. When I rerun everything, we are ready to, to create a C chart. And for the C chart, we will use the events variable. So for each month we have, in the first month we have nine events and then we had 16 and 13 and whatever. And again, these ev events can be anything that's uh, usually it's unpleasant and it's pretty rare. So nine complaints or nine pressure ulcers or nine infections or uh, nine uh, whatever uh, happening in this month, we would plot a C chart of that. So um, we will write the SPC function for the month on the X axis and the events on the Y axis. If we run this, we don't get a control chart 
because we haven't specified what type of chart we want to use. We need to do that. Here is your C chart with control limits, three standard deviations below and above the center line. Okay, please go ahead and add the C chart. You need to add these two lines to do the calculation of mean and standard deviation. And to test your code, you can do this. I'll show the code for this center line. And this is what you should focus on. Okay, go ahead. And again, you may raise your hand whenever you have uh, finished your assignment, or you may ask questions or complain or whatever in the chat. I ask a question um because yeah. you were saying earlier that the eye chart is pretty robust really it can be used for many different situations that we have in healthcare but then sometimes I, I think the c would be more count would be more appropriate do, what kind of decision process do you go through to decide between them do you look at them both or do you do something more structured and say this belongs here well um uh, as I have, um, I guess when you get more and more routine in using control charts, you don't think much about it. it it's obvious to you that, that this is for the C chart and this is for the I chart, but it's a very good question. And in fact, you should, you should try. Mohammed has uh, written, uh, published a paper uh, arguing that you should always uh, produce an I chart together with your C, P or U chart. And if the I chart differs significantly from the C, U, or P chart, then there's something wrong. So, so you you might want to. Oh, what was that? Uh, you you may want to. Um, bo, 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 bo. I, yeah, this is the code. I, I I think I will copy this and then I will create an I chart. So now look what happened. Now we are going to to produce an I chart with the same values as for the C chart and then compare them. Um, the control limits should be close to the same with an I chart. Uh, and if they are not, then there's probably something wrong. Then there's some, probably something wrong with your assumptions about data being uh, distributed uh, by a, a Poisson distribution. And then you can always use the I chart. But the Poisson distribution may be more correct if your data are truly uh, Poisson distributed. Um, so, but, but again, whenever, whenever we talk about the I chart was originally developed for measure data, whenever you measure something, but it's, it's, it's very often a very good proxy also for percentages and rates and counts. So it's kind of a Swiss army knife for, for SPC. And it's always a good idea to plot your your I chart uh, alongside your your C, U, and P chart, and it's it's very different. Then then you should look for an explanation. That's case, reassuring. because yeah. I was thinking that it it feels like a uh, a bit of a you're not getting it quite right if you're plotting everything. You know, you're throwing it into all of the different charts and then looking at it. Like you should actually know which one you're using, but if the recommendation is to actually, yeah, plot it, look at it, that's really reassuring. And that, that's another very good reason for always uh, to begin with the run chart. You can never go wrong, uh, go wrong with a run chart. Um, uh, and and then if you need some more power from from the control limits, then use a control chart. And then think about uh, what is your expectation, uh, where where do data come from, and if doubt use an I chart. Um, and if you're certain that this is a, these are counting uh, rare events, then use a C chart. And if you want a rate of rare events, use an U, a U chart. And if it's clearly a percentage, use a P chart. 
Okay, is everybody good to uh, move on? Uh, I guess you can guess where we are heading now. Um, the next chart we will be looking at is the uh, the U chart. The U chart is almost it, it's 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 uh, used for the same type of data as the uh, as the C chart. The data that uh, um, uh, Liam, you raised a hand. Yeah, sorry, Jake. It's just a, a a quick one um, on here. So when I run everything in the function individually. I get my upper and lower control limits, but when I run it actually wrapped in the function, for some reason, they're not plotting. I'm not entirely sure what it is that I've done wrong. Um, please try and clean your working environment by, by restarting. Um, that's the shortcut control shift F10 if you're on a local uh, R and, and in the, in the, uh, in the R cloud, where do you go? You go it's the same. Machine. So it will still work it and also work. yeah so it should do session and then clear your work or restart oh no restart yeah yeah restart r it's always a good uh, uh, thing to restart r once in a while i guess you have uh, objects lying around from from uh, something we have done before because you are, you should not be able to run the code inside a function line by line it should complain then so could you try and restart it and then you should source everything. Okay, I'll get cracking with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Um, so to, 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 to repeat, if you have something inside a function, it will not work if you if you run it line by line, because it, it, it will not know uh, the, the, the uh, What's the, the value of the chart variable? Because you haven't told it the, ch the chart variable that's inside the function call. But if you had this chart lying around from when we played before we made this function, it will, it will use that value and that will give you different outputs for, for the individual lines that you will get from the whole function. Now, um, again, back to the, um, to the U chart. The U chart is, is also for count data, counting events. Um, but in the U chart, you want to normalize your data. And instead of uh, providing the uh, counting the events, you want to count the number of events per some unit, the per area of opportunity. Um, and actually, the U in U chart stands for unequal area of opportunity. So if you have the same number of patients every month, it makes sense to count the number of infections uh, simply in a C chart. If you have very different number of patients every month, you might want to, to divide your data by the number of patients. And here we are counting number of patient days. We can actually see that there are differences. Some months we have few patient days and some months we have more patient days. And then it might make more sense to create a U chart. So for this, for the U chart and also for the P chart, we would need to provide the denominator as an argument to the SPC function. So the first thing we'll do is to make room for a denominator. Uh, and please don't worry, we'll take a long break uh, very shortly. Uh, the denominator, let's call it N. And let's, uh, by default, the value is null. But we need to use the n, the denominator, for u and p charts. Uh, to calculate the mean of in in a, in a rate, you would want to sum everything in the numerator. That would be all the y values, and then to divide by the sum of all the denominators. Can you see that if you want? the mean of this column divided by this column, you first sum these and then divide by the sum of these. That would give you the overall weighted mean. Don't calculate the rate for each month and then take the average. That would not be the right one. You need to sum all the events and sum all the denominators. That would give you the mean. And then the standard deviation as before, square root of mean, and then we divide by n. This is just the formula. 
you can see here on my web page here we have the u chart this is how to calculate the mean plus and minus three times the the center line divided by the the denominator in each data point and then we need uh, we, we should not forget to recalculate y because actually the individual data points is the numerators divided by the denominators. So these are the things you need for your U chart. Uh, let's test it. I rerun everything to make uh, ready. Um, and then I will D events, and then we need the denominator. D, uh, it's uh, days, isn't it? Yes. Ah, can you see? And what's special about the U chart? Any opinions? This looks a bit different than the other charts we have created. What is that? I want see? to say wobbly lines, but I don't think what? that's the the, yeah, the, that's right. the correct wobbly. way. <laughs> wobbly. The control limits are no longer straight lines. So the, the lines, and that, that's the, the main advantage of using U and P charts that they take into account the, uh, the, the size of the, the denominator. And that, that's about the one good reason for using U and P charts rather than I charts, because the I chart doesn't care about the uh, denominator. It makes straight lines. So if your denominator is varying uh, a lot, if your number of patient or patient days differs very much from data point to data point, uh, the U or, or, or P chart would be more accurate. So um, uh, please uh, add the U chart and uh, when you have done that, we will add the P chart and then we will have a break for, I suggest 20 minutes. Also my computer needs some juice to be able to, to run, but, but create the U chart and here is the three lines you need in order to have the U chart. And also you need to add this, uh, the N argument. Default is null, but it, when you need it, you have to, uh, to provide it. Okay, five minutes. Can have more. Sorry, Q. So, one patient may have more than one pressure ulcer, but if we are counting patients, we are counting pa patients with one or more pressure ulcers. So, a patient with three pressure ulcers would create three three events, uh, but only one one patient. And the P chart is for percentages. So, in in the case of a P chart, the numerator and the denominator will always be of the same kind. Patients over patients. In C in U charts, the numerator and the denominator will always be of different kinds of things. Pressure ulcers versus patient days or traffic accidents by uh, miles of, uh, of, of cars running. Um, so the P chart is based on number of cases divided by the number of patients or uh, more generally uh, some number out of some other number, but of the same kind of the same units. And the principle is the same as with the U chart. It's actually, uh, I will copy this code because we only need to change one line. The, the center line of the P chart is still the sum of the uh, numerators divided by the sum of the denominators. But then uh, the, the um, standard deviation is the square root of the average percentage multiplied by one minus the average percentage divided by n. And again, don't try to understand this. This is simply a fact. 
that this is your center line. So I rerun everything and then I go down here and I say SPC on the X axis I want month and then I count cases over patients. This will give me a run chart and this will give me a P control chart. Again, wobbly lines. Easy peasy. So I will give you the, um, where is it? It's here for you to implement and then uh, test it by using this line of code. Um, I think we should take a, a break now for about 20 minutes. So that would say five minutes to three, we will meet again. And if anybody needs help during the break, please uh, say so in the chat and Zoe and I will be uh, available. Um, and so you have provided the um, link to the solution, yes. Now actually we are, we are getting so far that it might make sense for you to look up in the, in the solutions uh, that you have already downloaded. Okay, five minutes to three, we'll meet again. And if you need help in the break, uh, say it in the chat. See you. Oh, I'll just record. Thank you. Welcome back. Are you ready for the last bit of this workshop? Or are you simply too tired to move on? Then please uh, fall asleep. That's okay. We have covered uh, the most important things until now. And I guess you can see uh, the principles we're working on. Um, uh, we could actually, we, now we only need to add functionality to this SPC function to make it do exactly what we want. Um, uh, th there's a piece, uh, th there are a few, a few things we need to fix before we move on. First, in, in, in P charts and C charts and U charts, the values can never go below zero. We cannot have a negative percentage of patients uh, with complications and you cannot have negative uh, uh, numbers for traffic accidents and so on. And um, therefore it doesn't make sense uh, that the control limits can go below zero. Actually in this, I have to clean up this, my screen. Um, and also mute my video not to distract you. You can see actually in this in this chart the control limit um, goes below zero. This is not wrong. This is the uh, the calculated control limit, but um, it's customary to um, to reset control limits to zero whenever they they go below zero in P and U and C charts. And for P charts, it doesn't make sense for numbers to become uh, more than one if you are uh, uh, reporting a proportion or above 100% if you're using percentages. Um, so um, we have to find out which of these, um, uh, when the control limit goes below zero, we want it to become zero. So how would we do that? Um, we will wait, go back in the code and um, after these lines where we define the, the center line and the control limits, we will reset the lower, uh, the lower control limit for P, U and C charts. So if chart in, that means in means uh, if it's one of those, and then we create a vector of C, U, and P charts. If, if the chart is one of these, you should, the lower control limit, where the lower control limit is below zero, should be zero. I'm not sure if everyone has seen this construction before, but we are making a logical vector if the lower control, remember the lower control limit is a vector of the same length of the y value. 
it's actually data points along this line. And every time it goes below zero, this logical vector becomes true. And so we are, uh, and if we are putting those in these square brackets, it means take the lower control limit, but only the values that are below zero and then replace those with zero. Let's try and rerun the code and see if this works. It worked and you see now the control limit does not go below zero. So if it's a C chart, a U chart or a P chart, take uh, the part of the lower control limit that is below zero and, and uh, uh, reset it to zero. And we can do the same with the upper limit. If chart equals, now we use equals P, then the upper control limit that is above one gets the value of one. That's it. So uh, whenever you have a percentage that's very close to 100%, the control upper control limit might go above 100%, but we will reset it. Um, so uh, that's, that's a way to fix this. Um, I want you to introduce these two uh, pieces of code in your code before we move on uh, any further. And again, raise your hands when you are done and uh, ask the questions in the, in the chat. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the formulae that we're using for the control limits, they are also in Mohammed's paper. Um, if you're using the paper version of the paper, there's a typo in the table uh, for calculating the I chart. Uh, but otherwise, it's a, a perfect resource for, for the control limits for, for these uh, C, U, and P charts. You have the formula there. Okay. Um, did you notice we solved everything with uh, the four basic control charts? Now we have a function that is able to, in one line of code, like this, this line, to um, create any control chart uh, of the four we have uh, discussed um, and uh, fixing the problem with control limits going beyond reasonable limits below zero or above 100%. So um, we are very close to our target uh, and I will take this uh, function and then I'll move it to the next assignment. Uh, but, 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 uh, wrapping up, we're getting there. Can you see that? I think I'll put it in here. So what do we need to do now? We need first to allow data to be in a data frame. Uh, we don't want to, uh, to use this clumsy notation uh, using dollar signs to access the variable. We want to be able to provide a data argument and then simply use the names of the variables in that data frame. And then um, it's useful to have uh, the ability to multiply argument. You can see on this P chart we have here, the Y values are in proportions. Very often customers uh, prefer having uh, P chart values in percentages. So it could be useful to add a multiplication argument, say multiply the Y values by 100, then you would get percentages. And for rates, if you're counting patient days or uh, traffic miles or whatever, you might want to multiply by 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 or whatever suits your data best. Um, usually the Y values are most easy to read if the values are somewhere in, uh, in between zero and, uh, and 100. Uh, two digit values are easier to, for our brain to uh, to understand than, than proportions and very high numbers. So we'll do that. And then also we would of course like to be able to add titles and labels to our plot. And, um, and finally, customers very often want to be able to plot a target value as a horizontal line. Say we, we, we want to reach this target or we want to avoid this target. 
So that's what we're going to do now. First, we'll talk about how to allow data to be in a data frame. So um, uh, see, if I do this, I have a data argument. And this data argument, that should be the name of the data frame that holds the values for x and y and n. So if x, y, and n is in a data frame, like in the, in the case we have here with our data frame D, then the x values may be the month, and the uh, y may be the cases, and the uh, n, the numerators, the denominators, so will be the patients. Um, that would be nice uh, to, um, to be able to do that. But at the same time, we want to preserve the ability to make a very simple plot uh, by simply providing one variable to the SPC function. So how would we do that? So if data is in a data frame like this one, I would want to be able to um, write code like this. So these are the three variables. And then I provide a data argument, data equals D. That means these three variables exist inside the data frame named D. I would like to do that. Right now, I can't do it because it doesn't know what to do with this data argument. Oh, I haven't rerun everything. It can't find the cases. It won't find the cases and it won't find patients and it can't find months because it doesn't know what D is. Aha. Uh -huh. So how do we fix this? Well, I'll teach you a very neat trick um, that works. Don't ask me to explain how it works, but it will work. To get data out of a data frame, we use this construction. Eval substitute x. That's it. That's how you get x out of a data frame provided in a data argument. Um, I think I'll, I'll simply do it so you can see how it works and then I'll try and explain. I'll try. I'm not sure I understand it myself, but it works x, y, and n x, y, and n. Now it works. Look at this. Now I'm able to provide these variable names and tell the function that these variables exist inside the data frame D. This is very neat. At the same time, I'm able to provide the, the variables uh, in isolation as if they were part of the uh, of the base environment, I can even create a new variable um, like y and then still do this, it would still work. So it works whether the, the, the variables are inside a data frame or they are simply inside the environment. Um, this construction substitute is a function that takes a simple, in this case, x and simply returns the symbol itself as this, as if it was a uh, a variable. Eval func the eval function looks for this symbol inside an environment that is the data. And if it doesn't find anything in in the environment data which we provided as a data frame, it would look for it in the parent frame. That is our base environment. And as long as this is is uh, inside the function, it will work every time. So again, if you don't really get this, don't worry, um, it works and you, uh, you will be able to, uh, to study this uh, on your own later on. So please uh, uh, add this code. You need to add an argument for data with the default value zero, and then you need to extract the x, y, and n, n variables from the data or from the uh, parent frame if the data argument is not provided. OK, I'll give you a few minutes to, um, to fix that. Raise your hand when you're done.
Okay, I got five hands. That's half of you. Uh, so I'll move on on this. Somebody protests. Let's move on. Okay. Um, and again, this code is in the solution uh, script that you, that you have already received. So um, if we can't get it to work, uh, it will work from the solutions and you can study the details and you can read the help file for substitute and eval. Um, those are very strange function, functions uh, that are very useful for, uh, for this purpose uh, specifically to extracting data from a data frame. Okay, so what's the next uh, assignment? How do you add title and labels to the plot? Well, um, whenever you plot the base plot function, uh, if I make a base plot of uh, anything, I can do, I'll clean up my screen. I can add titles. You can see in, in, I'm, in I'm in the console now. I can add a title using the main argument. So here goes the title and I can add uh, labels for the Y axis using the Y lab argument. And now guess how to add the, oh, uh, yes, X lab argument. to add, and if you can even add a subtitle if you want to, using the sub argument. Now let's see if this works in our function. Here we have, um, I'll get rid of this, and we'll, we'll uh, continue with our P chart. I want to add a title, main, let's call it P chart. This doesn't work. There's an unused argument. We get an error, unused argument. So we could we could introduce a new argument to the plotting function, to the SPC function. We could introduce a new argument called main, but we could do something else. We could use the dot, dot, dot construction. Uh, some of you may have seen this before, dot, 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 if you add that as an argument, usually the last argument for a function call, it means take whatever the user writes here and send it on to um, whatever function is inside this. So take the dot, dot, dot and um, ship it on to the plot function. So if we add the same here, dot, 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 it will work. Here's a type. And we could add a while app here it goes the Y uh, label and say uh, this is this some month. So you can add you can even provide other other um, arguments for the plotting functions. I don't like the labels of the y-axis to um, stand on their head. So I use the LAS, I don't know what, why it's called that, and say I want horizontal labels for everything. You see, and you can provide many, all the, all the arguments that are available for the plot function will be caught by the dot, dot, dot constructions and sent on to uh, the plotting function inside our SPC function. So all you need to do is to add an argument dot, 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 and then you can, uh, you can add uh, labels and uh, titles to your plot. So please do that.
I see three hands. The rest of you, are you doing okay? Do you need help? Or do you just want to get home? Four hands, thank you. I've just been correcting my code because of the um, opening and closing brackets problem. Oh yeah. I ended up just copying and pasting it, which got rid of it, but that really cannot work. You know, when you just spend hours and still can't fathom it out, but it's now working. <laughs> it's all a bracket. It's a, well, our coding is all about brackets. I, I guess yeah. coding in general is all about brackets. And, and commas. Uh, and commas, brackets mm -hmm. and commas. Um, the devil's in the detail. <laughs> and uh, and you can spend enormous amounts of time. Are you familiar with the saying from the, the, the famous Danish physicist Niels Bohr about what makes an expert? Um, Niels Bohr, uh, he once said uh, that an expert is a person who personally has committed all possible mistakes in a very narrow field of work. Oh, that's fantastic. So, so, so this is the the uh, the uh, safe way to being an expert. Commas and brackets. Okay, only three hands. Uh, should we move on, or do you need more time? Please speak up if you need more time. Then I take it that we should move on. I actually forgot one thing. Um, before we should, uh, I ask you to add titles and labels. Uh, we have this multiplication argument. Um, as I said, it, it, it is sometimes useful to be able to multiply the y-axis by some factor, say 100 or 1,000 or whatever we might need. And uh, to do that, uh, we could add a, an argument that will multiply all the variables. Um, and we can do that in several ways. The easiest way is simply to uh, add this argument and have it uh, take the default value of 1. So whenever we multiply, we will by default multiply by one. That means we are not changing anything. But if we provide a specific value, um, it can be done. And then we should take care to wait to uh, multiply until all the calculations are right. So I, I wait until just before the plotting function. And then we take all the parameters that go into the plotting function, the x and the y and the control limits. So the y will now be y times multiply. And the lower control limit will be the lower control limit times multiply, and so on. Multi and the center line will be the center line times, oh, oh, that's another error that I have a, a very sensitive touchpad. So this happens for me all the time. Multiply. Uh, have I missed anything? I don't think so. Let's try. Uh, I rerun the code. At, at this time, I would like to restart R to start from a clean slate. Um, and then check that everything works. This works, and then we'll, we'll go down to our function and um, multiply by 100. That would give us percentages. Ah, it worked. And then we change the while app to be percentages. Now, isn't that neat? So the job, the task is to add the multiply argument. The default value should be one. And then just before you start plotting, if after all your calculations, you add, uh, you simply multiply each of the, um, of the uh, vectors that go into the plot by the multiply uh, value. Okay, got that. And after this, uh, I think we'll have a, a short break of five minutes. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do this. Um, and then we will uh, return at, uh, shall we say, five, 20, 25 minutes to four. Would that be OK with you? So we'll meet again in nine minutes. OK?
time. I need to learn that, so we to wait for the signal to start talking. Okay, uh, while uh, we had a break, I created a U chart, um, which is where the multiply argument really comes in useful. Um, if we don't use the multiply, we will have often have very small numbers on the y axis. And in this case, it, it actually doesn't make sense to say we have one event per uh, 0 0.05 something days. It's much, much more useful to say we have, we have about uh, 60 events per thousand patient days. It's much more uh, easy to understand for the human brain. So the multiply argument, I use that almost uh, always with, with the U charts in, uh, in particular, and sometimes with, uh, with P charts. Okay, any questions or uh, comments? Something in the chat? No. Now we are really getting there. Um, we need one more thing, the target. Customers, especially management, they always ask, have you reached the target? And um, to answer that question, it's useful to have a line, usually a horizontal line, um, it, and usually a flat line representing the target we are trying to either achieve or to avoid. Um, targets can be wavy if target changes over time, but, but for, for, the, for the purpose of this workshop, we will only work with a fixed target, a fixed value. So I will start adding a target, target argument, target equals, and this time I will use NA uh, because it should not be completely absent. The target actually has the value of NA, and then we will add that as a horizontal line um, together with all the other lines. Uh, pop, 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 pop. Let's add it here lines and then remember we need to repeat the target value the number of times we have the y so let's see if this works um the, for the u chart the target and and remember we have multiplied um the rate by thousand so we should think about that when adding the target value um we could of course uh, uh, decide to uh, also multiply the target. So we, we should uh, provide the target value in the same unit as the original rate. I don't think uh, many people will want that. So I, I am asking for a fixed target um, of 100 and this didn't work. Why didn't work? Multiply target equals 100. Uh, let's see, plot lines, red target length. Oh, I'm, I missed the X. X, and then actually I want the color to be, I like dark green. There you have it. And then of course you could, you could uh, manipulate uh, the target line, could be, it could be dashed or dotted or whatever you like. So this is how to add a target line, a fixed target line. And uh, I could change the, the target line, say that our target is 200. What would you expect to happen now? I would expect the target line to disappear because we need to include the target in the Y limits, in the, in the range of values that should be uh, surrounded, should, should be included in the Y axis. So that's very simple. There you have it. So if our target is 200, and this is our U chart. Um, note that we haven't we haven't discussed whether this target is an upper limit. Is this is this what we want to avoid? Do we want to be below this? If 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 the uh, if these events are, uh, are unwanted events, if they are um, if they are harmful events, we want to be below that. But sometimes we have a target we want to achieve, uh, and then we should be on the other side of the target. The target line doesn't tell that. You could, of course, include, if you wanted to, different colors for different types of, uh, of targets, whether it's an, an upper limit or a lower limit. I have tried that in um, previously, and, and uh, 
usually the users get confused if you make that very complicated. So I prefer to, to provide that information as, um, uh, as part of the documentation of what the chart uh, shows. And you could, you could uh, add it as part of the title or as part of the documents that go along with the, with the chart. So this is how you add a target. So uh, roll back to the top and add this line of code. Target default value is in A. And then down here, you need to make two changes. One change is to include the target in the YLIM argument. And the other one is to make a new line for the chart. OK, uh, please do that. And I'll see you in three minutes or so. Uh, raise your hand when you're done. Thank you. I see three hands. Uh, is that because people are dropping off or am I talking you to sleep? I guess you are beginning to get a bit tired, but we are almost there. In fact, we have uh, we have our function now with almost all the functionality uh, we can ask for. Uh, there's one more thing I want to. Um, one more thing I want to. Uh, a little trick I want to show you. The chart argument by default is run, and if you and we and we have uh, we have made uh, functions for uh, five different chart types: the run chart, the I and C and U and P charts. What if we write uh, the name of a chart that doesn't exist? Uh, say, um, say SPC, uh, do we have a, I'll just uh, use uh, D measure. Sorry, I clean up my screen. What, what, if, we, what if we ask for a chart that doesn't exist? say the X chart, it doesn't exist. Uh, so we get an error. Um, we, can, um, we can help the user a bit by providing a list of, op of, of uh, optional charts. So of all the charts that are available, if we, um, we, if we wrap this argument like this, run, and, and then list all the opportunities in a vector I, C, U, P. These are the options that we have. If I rerun everything, I will get a new error because it doesn't know which chart I choose. But these are the, the, uh, the available charts. The only thing I need to do now is to, before we are starting to use the chart, we have to get the chart. So chart is, and this function is called match arc. So it simply matches the argument. And if we haven't provided anything, it will, it will, it will take the first of these options. So now it will work. The, we ask for a chart named X and we get an error message that's actually useful. Arc should be one of, and then we have the options here. So, um, Change this, this chart argument line to this a vector using the C function with the available charts, and then add this line to actually get the chart from this argument. So the rest of the code will work. And I promise you, when you have done this, um, there will be no more coding unless you ask for it. And, uh, and for the rest of the afternoon, as long as you are able to continue, uh, we could discuss uh, whatever you want to discuss. And I could give you a brief introduction to the QI Charts 2 package, which does all this plus a lot more. So add these uh, lines of code and raise your hand when you're done. Who 
poor Matthew, who had to deal with a lot of uh, of uh, things at the same time, <laughs> a lot of multitasking today. Okay, now we have actually completed the assignment. Um, I hope, and you can see here is actually uh, this, the, the, the solution, the interface to the function that I wanted you to create during this day. So we have a function with these arguments and this is what we actually have created. I hope that all of you have something that looks at least a bit like this. Otherwise, uh, you may uh, go start the solutions file that you got in the, uh, from, the, from the beginning. But this is our base SPC function that makes these four types of charts with um, empirical center lines and limits and the ability to multiply the y-axis and to add a target line. And um, uh, first and foremost, it has um, very strong visual clues that uh, uh, the process is changing by either uh, marking data points outside the control limit or by marking the center line if any of the runs tests um, uh, suggest non-random variation. So, we have, and we have data in a data frame. So um, there's always a discussion um, when, how do you decide when the target has been reached? Um, managers often want to celebrate whenever a single data point reaches the target. Um, and please celebrate, but um, we should think about when has a target really been reached? It has not been reached when one single data point uh, kisses the target line. We need to create a stable process that is working at a satisfactory level. And there are actually two ways you could do that. You could either decide that we are satisfied when the center line is on the, on the desired side of the target. So if these are unwanted events and our target is to be below 200, we're happy because the center line is below 200. We could also decide that uh, we want um, we 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 don't want in the future any value to be above the target line, and then we should strive for the control limit to be on the correct side of the line. Uh, that's a discussion I actually I have never heard it uh, being taken by managers. What do we mean by reaching the target? And usually when managers say the target has been reached, they, just, they simply mean that the latest value is on the, the right side of the target. But um, uh, people like us should help them to, uh, to understand that we are never interested in single data points. The individual data point is of no interest to us. It's the process as a whole. And what we are striving for in healthcare improvement are stable processes. We want stable processes that are functioning at a satisfactory level. And that means that either the center line is on the desired side of the target or that the control limits are on the desired side of the, of the target. Uh, that's my take on it. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you have experience taking this discussion with your, your managers. Um, now, I have some questions. Uh, we don't have to go, go through them, but I want you to think about what next, what about error handling? What could go wrong uh, when trying to plot data like this? Um, and what else would you like from an SPC function? This, uh, th this is a very primitive function that plots one chart at a time. Uh, is there anything else you want? Um, are there any other types of charts that, that you want? So I, I, um, I would like you to, um, to think about these questions and then I would like you to participate in a, 
in a discussion by simply speaking out. So should we meet in five minutes and then have this discussion for maybe uh, five, 10 minutes? And then I'll give you a very short introduction to the QI charts package. Uh, and I would be very happy to hear your feedback on this workshop. Uh, I really need your help to uh, improve. I would like to know what, uh, what went well and what could have been uh, better. Also, you are very welcome to write me a personal email suggesting uh, things I should work on or improve or emphasize or whatever uh, in future workshops uh, like, like this. But um, take five minutes break now and then let's, uh, let's meet for a discussion. Uh, uh, I hope you will, will speak up or participate in, in the chat. And what, think about these questions. What about error handling? What could go wrong uh, in, in, this, uh, in this function? And what else do you want from, from uh, an SPC function? So we'll meet at uh, 4 o'clock precisely. See you. OK, so we talked about in the discussion that uh, error handling is important. Uh, we should be able to handle missing values. Uh, if there are missing values in, in the X, Y, or N um, uh, vectors, we should handle that. And that might not be, that may not be a simple task. Uh, we won't do that today. Uh, and then we talked about uh, what we would want uh, from from a what we would want more from an SPC function, and we talked about how to be able to split the control limits and the center line uh, for different time periods with different levels of, of quality, uh, or we want to freeze the center line and control limits to a baseline peri period um, that we want to test our new data against. And, um, and these uh, things are actually uh, available in the QI charts 2 package. So uh, I will now close this one and then I will go back to, uh, to the files. I have this uh, file called QI charts 2 examples and that's a script file which includes a lot of examples of how to use QI charts 2. And then I have this R data which uh, contains a lot of example data sets so if you um, don't have to do it now, you can do it later by yourself. Open this file, the script file for QR charts. So you will have uh, not hundreds, but many, many examples of what to do with the QR charts 2 package. The QR charts 2 package uh, has a function called QIC, stands for quality improvement chart. And that's only because the SPC function was taken when I published this on CRAN. There's a package called SPC, so I called mine QIC. Um, and um, uh, I will simply run this. You need the, the package QI charts to install, um, and then you uh, need to load the, the data set I have created. Here I take it from the rep repository, but you can simply load it from your local copy of this uh, this data file. And, uh, and then if you need help with the QIC function, uh, you can of course always ask R for help or you can read the vignette. And I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the vignette. And it's also online quality. Um, uh, QI charts 2 has its own, its own web page and, and there's a vignette here that explains everything you need to know about uh, using the QI charts two package. So this is your go-to resource with lots of cases and examples of how to, to work with this. Uh, and it's also from the vignette that you have the formulas for calculating control limits. Um, but the basic functionality in QIC is exactly as the one we had with the uh, with our own SPC function. Here we, we create a vector of 24 random numbers and we plot it as a run chart in, uh, in, uh, in R using this simple function here. Pretty simple. And we can add uh, labels and titles using this function. Now we got the title, my first run chart, which is our measure on the y-axis and the sample number on the y-axis. 
and we can use QIC with data frames. Here we are using the data frame called blood pressure. It's a simple data frame that records um, 23 consecutive days of uh, blood pressure measurements and also pulse. And uh, this chart simply plots the systolic blood pressure versus the date. Um, there's also a data set with patient harm. Again, we have month and we have how many harms and how many patient days. We also have the number of patients that were harmed and the number of patients in this, uh, this sample. So this can be used for C charts plotting the harms, for U charts plotting the harms rate that would be harms divided by days or by or using P charts by plotting harmed patient uh, over number of patients, that's a percentage of harmed patients. Um, but what I really want to point your attention to is, um, uh, is the ability to, let's see, use faceted plots. Now, here we have a plot of number of hospital infections. The hospital infections data set is a, a large data. Actually, these are real data from my own organization. We have six hospitals in the, in the Copenhagen area, and we are monitoring four different types of infections, bacteremia, C. diff, uh, and urinary tract infections. And uh, I believe there are two uh, kinds of, of uh, C. diff infections. Monthly data, the number of infections divided by the number of patient days in that month. This plot plots everything in one chart, bacteremias and urinary tract infections and CDIs from six different hospitals. And actually that's not really meaningful. I want to see data for each infection uh, and I want to see data for each hospital. Um, and this is where QI charts to really starts to shine. You can facet or split your data in small multiples or a grid chart or trellis chart, whatever you want to call it. So here is a, a plot of hospital infections, one plot for each hospital, six hospitals. Um, you could also want to plot by both infection and hospital. So now you have two dimensions. And you see, and this is very, very useful. Each hospital, six hospitals here, and we have, sorry, I said four, we have five, four, three types of infections, bacteremia, uh, C. diff, and urinary tract infections. So this is a way to make a, a, a kind of dashboard that in one um, quick view uh, tells you uh, at which hospitals uh, are there anything else that, uh, than uh, random variation? We can immediately see that at this hospital, bacteremia, the center line is, uh, is that dashed, uh, which helps us to ask why is that? Is something changing here that we should look at? You can see that the Y limits are, uh, are synchronized. They're all the same. Uh, you might want to create individual Y limits for, um, for, uh, for each uh, hospital and infection. And uh, there's an argument for doing that too. So now each chart uh, or each infection has its own Y limit. It actually, it makes no sense to compare bacteremia with urinary tract, tract infections. So uh, it's, it's useful to split them and, and give them their own Y limits. So um, I won't say anything um, uh, more. I, I encourage you to to uh, go to the uh, QI Charts 2 uh, web page and to install the package and then work through the, the vignette. Um, and uh, also you may work through this, uh, the script I sent you. Uh, and after doing that, I don't think you will have any more questions about FTC ever, uh, ever, ever in, uh, in your life. Uh, everything is explained here, I hope. So, um, let me hear what you are thinking. Uh, are there any questions to the QI Charts 2 package before I stop sharing my screen, then speak up? Everything is totally clear. Oh, you have gone to sleep. That's great. I'll stop sharing my screen. Screen, sorry, screen. 
uh, and then I, I would very much like if any, any of you has any um, uh, advice for me to how to, uh, to make this workshop uh, better or, or functioning in the, in the future for future uh, vis victims of my, my teaching or uh, you are very welcome to uh, send me a personal email with all your suggestions and uh, I'm especially interested in, in constructive criticism. Um, be nice to me, but but uh, don't hesitate to tell me what I should have done better or different. Uh, that helps me improve my my teaching. Any comments on this workshop? <laughs> no comments. <laughs> Dead silence. You had a good one there in the comments then. Very well balanced and really interesting. Thank you. And a thank you above that. Yeah. I would like to ask a question about SPCs, particularly as you said about um, like rare events. Uh, you don't touch them very often or they're, they thankfully they're so rare in the context of being rare as well. And uh, I, I deal particularly with one particular very um, sensitive rare event, which is death by suicide or suspected death by suicide. And I don't, I want to use an SPC chart to show there's no trend because there is a, an expectation that there are trends because numbers can suddenly start all coming up. And is that actually something that's happened? They're not part of one particular process because we cover a vast area and geographically, but SPC feels like it can answer some of it, but then I have to be, am I using the right things? And I've been using T charts time between but some of the other things you covered today, I didn't know if some of those counts might have been useful or maybe you by rates. Yeah, well, well that, that uh, T charts for time between events uh, are useful. You could also use a, a, a run chart of time between, if you count the days between you have a, a, oh. a suicide, uh, that would give you a quick impression. Is, uh, uh, is this a stable process or uh, do we see any signs? Uh, time between events, uh, events um, uh, it's very slow to react when things change, and actually, if if uh, if the if if the rate is increasing, the time between events will go down, and you might have to wait. Uh, and especially if it's if it, the time between is increasing, that that actually things are improving, you have fewer suicides. You might have to wait a very long time until you get a signal on a run chart, and that's why you want a T chart with a control limit. But sometimes events are so rare that it makes no sense to use SPC. You simply have to look at each event. And, uh, and in, in the case of suicides, um, uh, you, you often want to do a root cause analysis of each individual suicide. But, but, yes. uh, but, but you, if, if the numbers are big enough, if, if you have more than, say, four or five events in a given time period, you might use a C-chart as well. Uh, the C charts and U charts uh, and P charts, they work very well if the numerator and the denominator are both above four or five. That's a rule of thumb. If you have more than four or five in the numerator and the denominator, you're usually uh, good to go with a P chart or a C chart. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions or comments? I see you have lots of you have written in, in the chat. Thank you so much for that. Then I think, well, I learned one thing that the, the program I planned actually fitted with the time I planned for it. And I also learned another thing that my laptop is running out of power. Uh, that's very unusual, but it must be Zoom <laughs> that, that uh, drains uh, the battery. Uh, so that was also useful. So um, I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for staying with me and for participating. And please write me uh, an email if you have any suggestions. And I'm especially interested in constructive criticisms and ideas for future workshops. Um, and I hope that I'll be able to give this workshop uh, again. I'd be happy. Zoe, you know I'm not part of the NHS, but if, uh, if you want to rerun this. I'd yeah, yeah. you're very well. Yeah. You're integral yeah. to the community. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and next time it will be much better. Thank you all. <laughs> I'm okay. going to pause this.